Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to all of you to our eighth event uh, marking International Rare Disease Day uh, here at the Broad. Uh, my name is Anna Greca. I'm an institute member here at the Broad, um, faculty at HMS and a physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And it really is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all here uh, this afternoon. Um, as I mentioned, this is the eighth time uh, that we here at the Broad are uh, marking Rare Disease Day. Um, and the theme for today is um, accelerating rare disease research uh, patients as partners. You know, there are about 10,000 rare genetic diseases on last count. Um, I estimate that we have maybe about 500 treatments available at best uh, for these diseases. So the mismatch between these numbers really um, speaks to the just uh, enormous amount of work that remains in order to um, help more patients um, out there. And we can't possibly uh, make progress if we don't actually partner with patients, not only because they are the ultimate stakeholders for pretty much everything that we do here, um, but also because in rare diseases, patients truly must be our partners. Uh, they can inform the kinds of cell models that we use, the animal models that we use, the mechanisms that we study, the biomarkers that we seek, um, the endpoints and the natural history studies that need to be uh, done in order to make progress toward the clinic. So in every sense of the word, uh, partnerships with patients are uh, critically important, and I think this is going to be a wonderful theme to explore um, today. Speaking of partners, uh, this is our second year uh, working in partnership with the Termeer Foundation for this event. And uh, this is a picture of Henry Termeer, who you could say he just started it all. He started it all in Kendall Square. He was the one who basically had the courage to pursue the idea of uh, going after rare diseases um, and to actually make it into a business as well as uh, something that can ultimately be catalytic for helping patients. And, and so it is my distinct and special pleasure and honor to welcome Belinda Termeer, um, Henry's wife, to um, give some introductory remarks as well. Belinda, thank you. Thank you, Anna. And thank you for putting that picture up uh, of Henry. Um, it's not a coincidence that rare disease, which is actually tomorrow, uh, falls on his birthday. So <laughs> I'm not sure if many people know that. But um, So welcome, everyone. My name is Belinda Tremere, and I am the president and co-founder of the Tremere Foundation. Um, it is my honor to also welcome you to this year's uh, rare disease event. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Broad Institute and for their partnership for, on this event, and specifically Drs. Anna Greca and Jillian Shaw. So the Tremere Foundation was founded to continue the legacy of my late husband, Henry. Our goal is to connect life science innovators, biotech entrepreneurs, CEOs, and visionaries, because we believe that helping leaders succeed will ultimately help their innovations reach patients. It is wonderful to see so many of you that are the same entrepreneurs, leaders, and visionaries coming together to raise awareness about the impact of rare diseases on patients' lives and to emphasize the need for research. In the words of Henry, we cannot afford not to come up with better treatments for diseases. As a society, this is where we should spend our best energy, use our best people, and focus our best efforts. Today, we are inviting everyone to join us in collaboration skill and knowledge sharing towards driving impact and change in the lives of rare disease patients and families. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Belinda. And it really uh, is very special that for the last two years, we've had the opportunity to partner with the Termeer Foundation for this um, event. Again, uh, it's, it's been a wonderful partnership. Speaking of partnerships, uh, for the last eight years, we've also been partners with Beyond the Diagnosis. And for those of you who do not know about this, um, it is a parent-led um, organization and they had this brilliant idea that awareness for rare diseases can be raised through art. And so if you walk through our Stanley Building lobby, you will see, as we do every year, we have uh, a series of portraits, beautiful portraits of um, children, primarily with rare um, diseases from the Beyond the Diagnosis exhibit. But this year, they've gone really big because now they're in Times Square for the whole month of February, uh, which is uh, Rare Disease Month. Um, 
these beautiful portraits are also displayed on the Jumbotron, so you can see this uh, here in the pictures. And I think this is just a remarkable way to uh, raise awareness and make it, make it human, you know, what it's like to, um, to have a child with rare disease and to uh, want the world to know and care about uh, their, um, their diagnosis. And of course, the uh, title of the organization and the exhibit is Beyond the Diagnosis, because beyond the, on average, eight to 10 years that the diagnostic odyssey lasts for a lot of families, of course, the next step is, well, what can be done? You know, what are the therapies out there? What can be done for, for these children? And so we will come full circle to that, and uh, we'll discuss it um, throughout the day today, and then come full circle to it at the end of the day uh, for some exciting um, announcements. And so I just briefly wanted to um, go through the agenda for today so you'll know what's in store and also for our uh, audience uh, who's online um, as well. Um, so we are incredibly lucky to um, have as our uh, first speaker uh, Vamzi Mutha. I will introduce him in a moment. Uh, so our spotlight is now on uh, mitochondrial diseases and we'll hear from Vamzi. Uh, we will then uh, hear from uh, Yael Weiss uh, and from Daniel Fisher, both of whom are uh, Termir Fellows and Belinda. We'll introduce them and we'll hear about their uh, incredible efforts. It is a special treat to have Tanya Simoncelli here today from uh, CZI's Rare as One, and she will tell us all the latest about that incredible uh, initiative, and, and it's really, um, it's been a, uh, remarkable to watch their success and, and hear more about it today. Um, then we are lucky to hear from Eric Pierce, uh, who um, really has been at the forefront of a lot of the newer therapies um, in uh, uh, retinal degeneration uh, diseases, and I think uh, we're in for a treat to hear what the latest is um, in that space. Then we will be uh, in for perhaps the biggest highlight of the day, the panel discussion. Uh, it will really be an opportunity to hear from all of our speakers, uh, and in addition, uh, hear from Charlene Son Rigby, who is the CEO of Global Genes um, RAREX, uh, a remarkable organization that's trying to uh, bring together a lot of uh, rare disease organizations uh, to make progress. And uh, with that, uh, I will have the opportunity to close uh, the event with a special announcement, so uh, foreshadowing that uh, for all of you. And then we will have the opportunity to mingle and explore our Discovery Center out in the lobby for a little bit longer. So as you can see, we have a busy but really exciting afternoon. And so without further ado, um, oh, I was reminded to say that um, at the end of our panel discussion, uh, we are going to have a Q&A open to all of you. I did want to not forget to mention that. Um, and so um, uh, Gillian Shaw will be, um, will, will be uh, moderating the Q&A from the online audience, and of course we will have mics around the room uh, so that anyone can participate, and I hope that it can be a very lively, uh, interactive discussion. Um, I actually am also reminded to say the most important thing that I wanted to say at the end of my opening remarks, and that is, no event like this can come together without a lot of people working together. And there's one special person I want to definitely acknowledge, Jillian Shaw. Dr. Jillian Shaw is uh, chief scientific advisor extraordinaire for our team. And uh, she's really um, met with many of you and has pulled together a lot of these um, sessions for today. So Jillian, a special thanks to you for pulling all of this together. <laughs> Absolutely. We are the three musketeers because there's also um, Katie Liguori, uh, who is really uh, remarkable at pulling all of these events together and making sure that everything goes off uh, without any uh, difficulties. And so Katie, thank you so much again for all of your efforts. And because I know I will forget at the end of the day when I do uh, share with you some exciting news, there will be some uh, beautiful graphical art that uh, was done by Mary O'Reilly in collaboration with Katie Liguori. So one is very lucky if one's assistant also happens to be a graphic designer, as is the case with Katie. And so Katie and, and Mary O'Reilly collaborated on some beautiful designs that I will show you at the end of the day, but I want to make sure that I acknowledge both of them and their efforts. And so also thank you to Mary O'Reilly for that. Um, yes. <laughs> All right, and so without further ado then, I think we're um, in for our first speaker. And so uh, Vamzi Mutha is our keynote speaker for today. Um, Vamzi is an institute member here at the Broad. He's also the founding co-director of the Institute's Metabolism Program. Um, he is also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor of systems biology, uh, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and um, in the Department of uh, Molecular Biology at the Mass General um, Hospital. 
Vamsi, um, anybody who knows uh, Vamsi and everyone knows Vamsi, um, is really known for his pioneering work on mitochondria. He built a foundational resource that probably every investigator out there has at one point used called the Mitocarta, which is really an incredible inventory of uh, uh, mitochondrial genes. Um, and uh, he has, in addition, made some remarkable mechanistic discoveries involving uh, mitochondrial mechanisms, some of which we will have the benefit of hearing today. But the most remarkable thing about Vamsi, I've looked up to him since I was in medical school, you know, um, is that he is truly an incredible scientist. He's uh, an incredible human, a wonderful colleague. Um, he has taken the idea of understanding genetics and computational tools and brought them into biology in a way that's very unique in my opinion. And um, I think he's really done some uh, incredible work that uh, is now at the doorstep of helping patients. And so it is really a unique and special pleasure to welcome you, Vamsi. Thank you so much for speaking today. Great. Thank you, Anna, very much for the extremely uh, kind uh, and very, very generous uh, introduction. I'm just looking for the, um, the ah, okay, great. So it's a real pleasure to be participating in this year's rare disease uh, event. Um, uh, uh, rare diseases is something that's extremely near and dear to, to my heart and to that of my laboratory. We've been focusing on these rare diseases for an extremely long time. And uh, over the course of the next 25 to 30 minutes, what I'm hoping to do is to introduce all of you to this spectacular organelle, the mitochondrion. And then what I want to do is I want to introduce you to some of the rare, ultra rare mitochondrial disorders that uh, are extremely, extremely uh, uh, important and very, very challenging. Uh, and then we're going to do a little bit of a blast of the past. We're going to go back about 20 years. And I'm going to share with you some of my own first experiences with some of these rare diseases in patient advocacy groups. Uh, and then I'm going to share with you some science and then what we're doing here at the Broad, working with some of the patient advocacy groups to try to further research in this space. So that's the outline for the next 25 minutes or so. So I do have some relevant disclosures. And we'll get started. And so this is the uh, organelle that I first fell in love with almost exactly 30 years ago. I came to Boston for medical school in 1993. And as a first year medical student, it was, uh, it was uh, th these types of electron microscopic images that absolutely fascinated me. These are beautiful organelles. They're called the powerhouse of the cell because they house the machinery for oxidative phosphorylation. This is the pathway by which the oxygen that we're breathing is being used to make ATP. Uh, and these mitochondria look like bacteria because one and a half billion years ago, they were bacteria. And we still retain a vestige of this bacterial ancestry. We still have a DNA that's found within this organelle. So all of these properties just absolutely fascinated me and made me convinced that this is what I wanted to investigate. So half of our lab investigates this organelle from a basic biology perspective. The other half of our lab is really interested in what happens when mitochondria break down. As it turns out, all of us, as we age, the uh, number uh, and activity of mitochondria, which is shown on the y-axis, declines. This is one of the strongest signatures of the aging process. And the billion dollar question is whether this is cause or effect. Is the decline in mitochondrial activity actually uh, driving the pathology, or do you have sick tissues, do you have sick mitochondria? Now, at the opposite end of the extreme, which is gonna be the focus for today's talk, are a very large collection of rare diseases, such as Friedrich's ataxia, or even ultra-rare diseases, things like Lee syndrome. These are very rare genetic diseases where patients are born with a defect in their mitochondria, and there's no doubt that the mitochondrial defect is causal for the end, patho the end pathology. So we're interested in these diseases for a number of reasons. Number one, um, uh, they have no proven medicines as of today, and we, we feel a sense of urgency to try to do research for these types of ultra-rare diseases. Uh, number two, uh, by partnering with these patients and uh, uh, their families, uh, we also believe that we can gain important, important mechanistic insights that will help them, as well as others that face various forms of mitochondrial dysfunction. 
So I'm going to dive a little bit into some of these rare diseases. So today, when I'm talking about a rare mitochondrial disease, I'm typically talking about a defect uh, either in the mitochondrial genome, which I'll introduce in a moment, or in the nuclear genome. These disorders are associated with a tremendous amount of phenotypic heterogeneity. Almost any organ system can be impacted because this is such an important organelle. And as of today, uh, we don't have a single FDA-approved medicine for this very large collection of diseases. And they're very challenging. We can have two diseases that have uh, uh, mutations in two different genes that are part of the first part of this oxidative phosphorylation uh, machinery. And in one, uh, if you have a mutation in a particular subunit, those patients will only develop eye disease. But if you have mutations in the neighboring subunit, in a subunit that's equally conserved in evolution, those individuals will actually have all of the symptoms that are shown over here. So even though nominally both mutations are impacting the same complex that nominally subserves the same function, in one case you have a tissue-restricted disease, in another you have multisystemic disease. So this is very, very complicated. Now, um, I'm going to take a quick uh, blast to the past. We're going to go back a little bit more than 20 years ago or so, because as it turns out, the Broad Institute actually played a very important role in uh, one particular rare mitochondrial disease when I was a postdoc, and I actually had the privilege of actually being able to participate in that particular study. And uh, a little bit of background, uh, the mitochondrial genome, which I introduced earlier, that was sequenced in 1981, and that was sequenced by Fred Sanger and colleagues, and it only encodes 13 proteins total. And so, in 2001, when I was finishing my clinical training and I was about to start my postdoc, much of the field of mitochondrial medicine was narrowly focused on the mitochondrial genome as the source of disease. Almost every single exam on the board exam, almost every single question on the board exams related to mitochondria was mtDNA and maternal inheritance. Right? They were almost synonymous. Um, but as it turns out, the vast majority of the machinery for mitochondria is nuclear encoded. And right as the nuclear genome was being sequenced, uh, I joined uh, uh, initially Matthias Mann's group in Denmark to learn proteomics, and then Eric Lander's group over here in Boston to uh, understand the nuclear genome's role in mitochondrial biology. And uh, as I was beginning to learn a little bit of genomics, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting somebody named John Ryu. So John Ryu was a research scientist in the Lander Laboratory that happened to be from Montreal. And he was actually working on this disease that I'd never heard of. This is called Lee syndrome. And it was a French-Canadian variant. This, at the time, was actually the most common genetic disease in the saguenay lac saint John region of French Quebec. Uh, it impacted about 1 in 2,000 live births with a carrier rate of about 1 in 23 due to a strong genetic founder effect. It's a devastating disease. Uh, 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 associated with both liver disease as well as with something called Lee syndrome, which is a subacute degeneration of uh, the gray matter. Um, and a lot of these kids were actually dying in uh, infancy as well as early in uh, childhood. And um, John Ryu at that time had received a $50,000 grant from the foundation that was started by Pierre Lavoie. He had actually lost two children from Lee syndrome. And at one point, he was one of the world's top 10 triathletes, a real, real athlete. And he actually had these uh, bike a to basically raise money. And he had provided John $50,000 to help to find the disease gene. And this all happened before I joined as a postdoc. And what was really, really cool was John Ryu. I met him during the first few months when I was a postdoc. And uh, he's here as a last author. He told me about a new paper that they had just published. He worked very closely with somebody named Mark Daly, who was arguably one of the leading human geneticists. And uh, just a quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of genome-wide association studies, GWAS? Okay. So the first successful application of GWAS was not type 2 diabetes, it was not schizophrenia, it was actually Lee syndrome French Canadian variant. It also goes by the name of uh, LD mapping, but this is the first successful application of, of GWAS. And uh, it was a remarkable study. And uh, using this uh, approach, they were actually able to narrow down the disease locus to 2P16. Now, because you could only observe a limited number of meioses, they had a limited recombination resolution they're stuck with a region of the short arm of chromosome 2. And uh, John asked me, hey, this is a mitochondrial disease. Uh, we hear that you're interested in this organelle. Can you help us figure out what the gene is? 
And so this was a, a fantastic experience for me. And uh, I was able to uh, take some of the proteomic data that I was generating, and I mapped it onto this interval. And I also wrote some very simple code at that time to look using the freely available gene expression data to look for co-expression patterns related to mitochondria. And by, triangulat by triangulating across these three data sets, we're actually able to zero in on the disease gene, which is called LRPPRC. So it was a super, super fun uh, experience uh, for me. And uh, this was actually big news uh, at the time. Uh, it was even covered in the Wall Street uh, Journal. Uh, as a consequence, that particular community actually set up population carrier uh, uh, screening and uh, testing as well uh, so that couples uh, would know if they were carriers. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, this disease has almost been eradicated at this point. And uh, the mother of, uh, 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 there's a woman who lost two kids uh, to this disease. Uh, and once the gene was actually uh, discovered, uh, she actually sent a copy, uh, one of the prints of this particular painting, which still hangs to this date uh, in our laboratory as a real source of inspiration. And so when people ask, What's the benefit of being able to work with patients and patient foundations? The number one answer I, I give always is inspiration. It is such a huge inspiration and privilege to be able to work with uh, patients and patient foundations. And so that was the first disease gene that uh, I was fortunate to be able to be involved with. And then subsequently, after I set up my own laboratory, just as Anna said, we used a number of techniques in modern mass spectrometry proteomics and proximity proteomics and uh, uh, computation, and we've now mapped out the entire mitochondrial proteome. So out of the 20,000 proteins made by the human genome, a little bit over 1,100 of them end up in this organelle, and in combination with the 13 proteins made by the mitochondrial genome, comprise the mitoproteome. And so this has been a very valuable infrastructure both for basic science studies, but also for disease gene uh, discovery studies as well. And uh, as of today, if we fast forward, as of 2023, there's approximately 300 monogenic disorders of the mitochondrial proteome. And uh, they follow this particular distribution, which is gonna be important later on. It's a very long tail of not rare, but ultra rare diseases. So there's some diseases like Friedrich's ataxia and MELOS, which some of the clinicians will remember from their board exams, these impact a few thousands of cases in the United States, and they may be amenable to things like gene replacement therapy one day. But you'll see that there's a very long tail in this cartoon. I don't call them N of one diseases because you actually can't publish in Nature Genetics with an N of one, you need like a five, 10 cases or so. So I call them N of 10 diseases, but it's an extremely long tail. And what we'd love to be able to do is to impact these disorders. And one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to measure metabolite biomarkers so that we may be able to connect some of these diseases in a, in a biochemically motivated way. And uh, our strategy has been to use a technique called tandem mass spectrometry with which we can literally measure thousands of chemicals in the bloodstream. And our goal is nothing uh, less than to come up with a blood test for mitochondrial function. Uh, and uh, the reason biomarkers are so important is because they will allow us to monitor disease progression, we may be able to classify these diseases, and importantly, in a clinical trial setting, we may be able to quantify therapeutic response as well. And uh, what we've done is we've worked with some of these patient foundations, and we've done very focused metabolomics discovery studies. So working with the French Quebec group, for example, is a small study but we uh, did a study of nine versus nine, so nine patients versus nine controls, but it was extremely, extremely carefully, prospectively controlled, and we did one metabolomic study with that group. We did another uh, metabolomic study on MELOS in collaboration with our colleagues at Columbia and so forth. So we've done a couple of these, and uh, at this point, we now have a small collection of about 19 metabolites or so total that read out mitochondrial function, dysfunction. And in fact, uh, it is even strongly correlated to subjective uh, scores of uh, disease severity. So we now have a panel of metabolites uh, that correlate to things like the Karnofsky score. And so our long-term vision is that when we have a patient with mitochondrial disease, from a single uh, uh, blood draw, we'll be able to establish a genetic diagnosis, and then we'll be able to biochemically stage uh, that patient. Uh, and then the hope is to deliver a therapy so that we can then monitor the biochemicals to see whether or not they're responding. 
And so that's our vision. And so the one thing that's missing right now are novel therapies. And what I want to focus on over the next 10 to 15 minutes are some of our efforts to try to develop new therapies for these diseases. And so our strategy has been to try to identify suppressors of mitochondrial dysfunction. Because there are so many different genetic forms, what we want is to find something downstream that we can do to, to suppress disease. And in 2016, we reported uh, what I think is a very, very exciting and uh, one of the most uh, fascinating uh, discoveries, I think, from my laboratory. Uh, we reported that hypoxia can suppress mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, and this was a PhD work of a talented graduate student, uh, Isha Jain, uh, at the time. And we'd used a CRISPR screen at that time that basically showed us that the hypoxia pathway was somehow very, very relevant for these disorders. Um, and uh, so we did some studies in cell culture that showed that if you poison mitochondria with chemicals, if we uh, lower oxygen levels, we could suppress some of these types of uh, disease phenotypes in a dish. But very, very quickly, we wanted to graduate into a mouse model. And uh, the mouse model that we focused on was something called Lee syndrome. And I introduced that earlier, the Lee syndrome French-Canadian variant. But that's one of 99 different forms of Lee syndrome. There's now 99 different genes that can underlie this deep gray matter disease. It's a devastating disease. Uh, and it's characterized by these bilaterally symmetric uh, lesions that can impact either the spinal cord, uh, the brain stem, or the uh, basal ganglia. Uh, and again, there's no proven therapies. Um, about uh, 12, 13 years ago, Richard Palmiter's group uh, introduced a mouse model of Lee syndrome that's fairly accurate. These mice are actually born developmentally OK. They wean at day 20, and then right around day 30, they start to get sick, and they die at about day 55 or 60 from their neurological disease. And these mice will also develop uh, lesions that you can pick up on MRI that are reminiscent of the lesions that we see in the human patients. And uh, from the screen that we had done, we got the idea that low oxygen might be good. Right? This is a bit paradoxical, because until then, a lot of people said, oh, the mitochondria aren't working. Let's give more oxygen. The screen actually told us the exact opposite. Let's, let's dial it down. And so I'm going to show you a video. Uh, and what we did is we have five mice. All five have the neurological disease, uh, except two of them have been living at the equivalent of Mont Blanc. Two of them are, are, are experiencing 11% oxygen instead of 21% oxygen. And healthy humans can tolerate 11% oxygen OK. And I want you to try to guess which two are breathing thin air. Hopefully, it's pretty obvious post-lunch. There's two that are trying to jump out of the cage. Those are indeed the two that have been breathing thin air. So these mice will typically die at about day 55 or 60 from their neurological disease. But if they're breathing thin air, this is what the survival curve looked like. And, and we stopped this study at that time because of publication. But if we continued the survival curve, the median survival is about 350 days, so just shy of a year. So just by lowering the ambient oxygen, they're moving from about two, year, to two months to almost a year. And it's not just lifespan, but it's also health span. And so they maintain their body temperature. You could see that they're bigger. They're putting on body weight. Remember I told you that we're identifying metabolite biomarkers that are altered in human patients with Lee syndrome? The exact same biomarkers, such as alpha hydroxybutyrate, which is an intermediate in transsulfuration, and uh, lactate, which all of you are probably familiar with, those are all elevated in the patients. They're elevated in the mouse model, and they come down by continuous breathing of hypoxia. And on the right, what you see uh, are uh, staining for neurons. But in uh, turquoise, uh, you see staining for microglia. This mouse model has a massive amount of neuroinflammation that's visible on MRI. And that is completely prevented, as you can see, by placing the mice in low oxygen. And so uh, we had approached somebody named Warren Zapal, who uh, uh, 
Uh, he passed away, unfortunately, a year ago or so. He was a wonderful, wonderful collaborator. Uh, but he was an anesthesiologist that had these hypoxic chambers. And he was stunned when he saw these results. Uh, and he then came back and said, hey, Vumsi, if low oxygen is good, why don't you try high oxygen? And so uh, he's the one that actually suggested this next experiment. So we decided to dial it up to 55%. And this is what we saw. These mice, uh, when exposed to 55%, which is an O2 level you may be exposed to in the hospital if you get anesthesia, for example, these mice will die within about three or four days of exposure to hyperoxia. We published this in 2016, and within a few days, I received phone calls from around the country from other clinicians who were caring for patients with mitochondrial disease whose patients had been placed in what's called hyperbaric oxygen. Oxygen is not particularly soluble in blood. We need hemoglobin. But if you place patients in hyperbaric oxygen, you can really increase the amount of oxygen in the blood. These doctors related to me stories of their outpatients that were placed in hyperbaric oxygen that actually became comatose and died within 24 hours. So devastating, devastating uh, outcomes. Two in Southern California, another, another two in uh, Northern California who actually had eye disease, this Libra's hereditary optic neuropathy. They're legally blind in one eye. Statistically, they're going to go legally blind in the other eye within a few months. But within a week of exposure to HBOT, both became blind in the good eye. And unfortunately, we had a similar case like this uh, years earlier at MGH uh, as well. So these are all anecdotes. Uh, but these anecdotes, probably in combination with our mouse study, strongly suggest that high oxygen, when the respiratory chain is broken, is a bad combination. What's happening? So we've placed probes into the brains of these mice. And what we see uh, is that the partial pressure of oxygen in the brain should be, uh, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen should be about 35 to 40 millimeters of uh, mercury. But it's much higher in these knockout animals. Remember, all the oxygen that you're breathing is being consumed by your mitochondria. And so we all say that the mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. But they do so by consuming oxygen. So when the mitochondrion is broken, we interpret this as high unused oxygen. And by placing the mice in low O2, we decrease the amount of unused oxygen. So our current working model of what's happening is the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, but it's also the main way that we consume O2. And when it's broken, O2 levels are elevated, and in fact, in the venous blood of patients with mito disease, we see what's called venous hyperoxia. They have a high unused O2. And we think that high unused oxygen is corrosive. It can cause bad signaling, but it can directly oxidize factors such as iron sulfur clusters as well as lipids. Okay. So that's, we're still working out the full mechanism, but at a high level, this is what our data suggests right now. Everything I showed you involved chronic continuous hypoxia. It was placing those mice uh, in a chamber continuously. Uh, and of course, the natural question is, will more practical regimens work? And unfortunately, more practical regimens are not working right now. We've tried intermittent hypoxia, because that would be amazing if we could have patients in nighttime hypoxia. They can go out for their activities in the daytime. But that does not work in this mouse model. How about not 11%, but Denver? No, 14%, 17%, those do not work. We need 11%. And I told you um, that we had this idea because of a genetic screen. How about if we genetically activate the hypoxia response? That also does not work. Uh, and uh, finally, I've shown you some remarkable results in the brain. But how about other tissues? These mice don't live forever. They live until year one. Uh, and they die because of the cardiovascular disease. And so the hypoxia is fixing the brain, but it's not fixing the heart disease. So there's still a lot of limitations to uh, this experimental approach. An important question is whether hypoxia can reverse any of the disease. These patients will present in the setting of a neurometabolic crisis with some of these T2 intense lesions on MRI already. So the question is whether any of this is reversible. These mice, unlike the patients, have a very stereotyped trajectory. And so we can follow them until about day 60, at which point they're going to meet our hospital's euthanasia criteria. Then we can start the hypoxia and see what happens. And this is what we see. It's really remarkable. They will regain their body weight. On MRI, these are the same mice. You can see these lesions of neuroinflammation 
And after about three weeks of hypoxia, we can make that disappear. And so this is our key discovery. Uh, we've been looking for suppressors for a really long time. And in hypoxia, we have found a very natural suppressor of mitochondrial dysfunction. And conversely, we find that high oxygen is actually toxic when the respiratory chain is broken. Now, I want to be clear. Uh, oxygen is life-saving. If somebody is hypoxic, they absolutely need oxygen. But very often in clinical medicine, we will give oxygen even when somebody is not hypoxic. For most of us, that's fine because our mitochondria will detoxify it. But if they're broken, this can be a very, very deadly combination. So some of the things that we're working on now are what is the full mechanism in cells and in animals? This is uh, a very, very, very um, uh, physiologic process. It involves both cells as well as a whole organism. So we're trying to work out the full mechanism. We want to know whether we can translate this into humans in a safe, effective, and practical way. And uh, finally, we want to know whether this will generalize to other models. The model we've been using is the NFS4 model. I'm aware of only one patient in North America that has NFS4 deficiency. And so it's, it's wonderful if we come up with a therapy for a single individual, but it'd be nice if some of this generalizes to other forms of mitochondrial dysfunction. And so um, the disease that we decided to next take it into is a disease called Friedrich's ataxia. So out of those 300 diseases, I showed you the long tail. Friedrich's ataxia is the most common monogenic mitochondrial disease. This is an autosomal recessive disease that impacts about one in 50,000 people. The cardinal triad is one of a, a sensory neuropathy, a cardiomyopathy, a type 1.5 diabetes. Uh, and it's due to a recessive loss of a protein called frataxin, which is important for iron sulfur cluster biosynthesis. In an ancient organelle, this is the most ancient pathway. Okay, making something called iron sulfur clusters, which are almost like uh, the components of uh, the wires for your body's electricity. Um, and so given uh, our interest in hypoxia, what we did is we basically placed uh, cells in which we've knocked out frataxin in hypoxia, and this is what we saw. We're now able to make complete knockouts of frataxin, which were not possible previously, and by placing them in hypoxia, we can take yeast if you knock out, not knock down, knock out frataxin, we can now grow them in yeast and they form new, new colonies. And uh, no one's ever been able to knock out frataxin fully in worms. Uh, people have done knockdowns. And if we knock it out, uh, it's completely lethal, as you can see in the upper right quadrant. But if we place these worms now in low O2, uh, they can now complete their entire reproductive life cycle under low O2 conditions. So it's an extremely strong suppressor. And so um, what I like to say is that when we think about human disease, we think about the cross product of genes and environment. And when it comes to mitochondrial disease, they have really strange genetics, two genomes that have to interact with each other. So that's already complicated, but we think that a very relevant environmental variable is environmental oxygen. Okay. And um, in the final few minutes, what I want to do is sort of share with you what we're trying to do here at the Bro to try to take forward a lot of exciting science, the science of hypoxia, but other exciting science forward. Okay. And in particular, how can we learn from some recent success stories in the world of rare disease genetics. And uh, two of my favorite stories are the story of Spinraza and the story of tri Trifacta. And just very briefly, Spinraza is a breakthrough medicine for spinal muscular atrophy. The gene was identified in 95. What's really important is really good basic biology reveal that next to the disease gene, as a backup gene. And if you can turn on the backup gene, you can complement the gene that was broken to begin with. You needed that basic science, and then when ASO technology came online, it was possible to target that, that other gene uh, and uh, uh, inflate it, basically. And so uh, you needed a combination of really good genetics, biology, and technology to make Spinraza a possibility. And similarly, I think many of you are familiar with the Vertex drugs. This gene was cloned in 89. I think one of the most important sort of basic science insights about the CFTR gene was its temperature sensitivity. There's a really important paper that came from Michael Welch's group at the University of Iowa that showed that if you take the common Delta F508 mutant cells 
They're defective at normal temperatures, but if you basically place them at a low temperature, there, you can completely rescue that defect. So there's nothing intrinsically wrong with it as long as you could stabilize a protein. So they showed that it was what's called a temperature sensitive mutant. And that science paved the path for finding small molecules that would mimic the effects of, of temperature, if you will. And that's what Trikafta basically uh, is. And so the key ingredients are a deep understanding of genetics and biology, uh, sort of uh, uh, clever use of emerging technology, and in all these instances, there's a deep collaboration across patients, foundations, academia, biotech, and the regulatory agencies. You need this entire ecosystem working together to make these types of miracles happen. And so with this type of inspiration, we started here at the Broad something called the Broad Institute FA Accelerator, the Friedrichs Ataxia Accelerator. And the real mission is to nucleate a group of investigators that are going to bring together various biological insights and technologies. We're gonna muster around one disease and try to tackle it. And uh, it's a three-year project, and uh, we're fortunate that was funded by two key phil philanthropists uh, via the Friedrichs uh, Ataxia Research Alliance, or FARA. And uh, I just have a few more slides. I wanna just give you a sense for how we nucleated and huddled around this disease here at the Broad. Um, and so this was launched initially with involvement from my group, focusing not on temperature sensitivity, but oxygen sensitivity, if you will, uh, and trying to move that forward for this disease. We also have Gary Rubkin's group. Gary's lab is a real expert in worm genetics and in identifying things like genetic suppressors. And uh, David Liu's lab is a pioneer in DNA editing. And the idea is that uh, in, in the initial uh, instance, the three of us were gonna be tackling this disease together. Uh, and again, using this G by E, uh, framework, uh, my team was going to start with this initial observation that low O2 is beneficial, but now we want to try to create hypoxia in a pill. Uh, in Gary Rubkin's group, what they have discovered is that now using this hypoxia trick, we can make worms that are mutant for, for taxin, but then he can feed the worms different types of bacteria, not E. coli, but bacteria that he has collected from exotic strains of uh, apples around the world, he's now identified a few bacteria. If you feed those bacteria to these worms that are lacking for taxin, he can now rescue those worms. And so the vision is, can we come up with a probiotic uh, therapy based on this data? And then David Liu's lab is trying to directly edit sort of the G, if you will, of uh, Friedrich's uh, ataxia using both prime editing and base editing. And a, an important design consideration for the FA Accelerator was that this is the founding group of investigators, but the uh, FARA agency has a deep expertise in this disease, and they've been telling us, hey, we need more research in A or in B. These are unmet needs. And they came and told us that one of the real important unmet needs uh, are investigations uh, of the cardiac disease in this disease. And so we're able to recruit uh, Jonathan and Cricket Seidman who are now investigating uh, the cardiac manifestations of this disease. And finally, one of the real challenges for uh, any of these neurological disorders is having high quality biomarkers with which to both classify and monitor disease progression. And uh, Anupam Gutta is a relatively new professor at uh, MGH. He's a Carnegie Mellon computer scientist um, and a neurologist uh, that focuses on movement disorders. So he's trying to come up with digital biomarkers that will actually uh, once FAA or somebody else is successful in developing new therapies, uh, his group is hopefully going to have really nice digital biomarkers that will aid in therapeutic uh, approval. Um, so hopefully this gives you a sense of how we're trying to work with uh, FARA. Uh, the, uh, the financial support is extremely, extremely appreciated, but also they bring so much deep expertise and sophistication, and, they, and it's because of them that we've all come together to focus on a particular disease. So grateful to them for a number of reasons. And so uh, I'm gonna close now, and I wanna just acknowledge my amazing, amazing group. I feel super lucky to be able to work with these students and postdocs and research scientists on a number of different problems related to mitochondrial biology and disease. We have benefited from a number of uh, funding agencies over the years. Uh, and uh, again, it's a real delight to be here to be speaking at Rare Disease Day. The folks that I'm most grateful to uh, professionally uh, are all of the patients uh, that do so much to uh, uh, 
uh, uh, serve as partners for our research, but most importantly, to uh, inspire us. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you have. So Vamsi, let's do questions in the Q&A a little later. So thank you so much. And sure. I think Belinda will make the next set of introductions. Awesome. Off. I don't know if it, oh, there it is. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Yael uh, Weiss and thank her for traveling to join us today from Washington State. Yael Weiss is the CEO and founder of Mozzie Therapeutics, board member of Fox G1 Foundation and a Tremier Fellow. Yael uh, completed her PhD at the Weizmann Institute of Science and an MD at the Hadassah Medical School at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She has over 20 years of industry experience in medical, clinical, and business development roles at Genzyme, Merck, and Ultragenics. Yael uh, founded Mozzie Therapeutics in 2020 to bring therapies to patients with underdiagnosed ultra-rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders. We look forward to hearing from Yael uh, about the success in developing therapies by partnering with patient foundations. Thank you, Belinda. I hope this is working. Um, so what Belinda didn't say is that I worked at Genzyme many years ago. It was my first genetic disorders company. Before that, I did my PhD on Down syndrome. We were still trying to isolate genes on chromosome 21 and see which one of them leads to the clinical presentation of Down syndrome. So I've always been interested in genetic disorders. I did deviate for a few years and went to Merck, which is a company that up till now has not been a player in the rare genetic disorders uh, area. But then I moved to Ultragenics and most recently funded Mozzie. And I'm very honored to be a Tremere Fellow. I'm sure Henry had really, really big shoes mm -hmm. that I have now to run into and follow. And thank you for everything that you're doing for rare diseases. So Mazi um, was founded to help advocacy groups who have mostly children, pediatric disorders with neurodevelopmental disorders. And I'll talk a little bit about Mazi as I progress through my talk. Uh, but I want to start with this slide. And um, you'll ask, why am I starting with a slide that talks about diagnostics? I think that this will actually lead to a uh, revolution in what's happening in rare diseases in the next 10 to 20 years, hopefully sooner. Uh, if you had a child with autism or a seizure disorder in 2003, the child likely would have gotten a clinical diagnosis, but very rarely would have gotten a genetic diagnosis. If it was a familial, familial disorder, inherited, maybe you could get a genetic diagnosis, but definitely not if you had a de novo mutation. It was very expensive to sequence the genome. It wasn't even something that was on the agenda to do a, a, a very broad screening. And your diagnostic odyssey most likely took many, many years. In 2013, things started to look a little better. You can see the prices of, of the genome sequencing went down. Uh, genetic companies, genetic diagnostics companies started to introduce gene panels. So if your gene was on the panel and your clinician suspected that you may have a genetic neurodevelopmental disorder, you may be lucky to get a genetic diagnosis. But since for most kids at the time, there wasn't any therapeutic answer or any a way to address specifically their disorder, the likelihood of getting diagnosis and getting it fast was very, very low. Uh, fast forward to today, the prices of the uh, genetic testing are going down. You can get your genome sequence now for $1,000 or less. Uh, full exomes or genomes are being sequenced. There are hundreds of genes that are known to be associated with, neuro with neurodevelopmental disorders. And there is access to this testing. 
not as great as I would like to see, but still it's much more accessible than it used to be. And you can get either a clinical diagnosis if you're referred by a clinician. If you're lucky and your child is, uh, well, lucky and unlucky, your child is hospitalized in the NICU and there's a genome project, genome sequencing project going on in that NICU, you may get a genetic diagnosis. And now with the new uh, projects, I saw Robert Green here, with all the newborn genome screening projects ongoing, hopefully there will be more and more kids diagnosed early on and being offered therapies early on. And 2033, the sky's the limit, hopefully. Um, there will be genomes routinely done. Um, there will be many more genes known, and we will get diagnosis earlier and treatments earlier. So the, what drew me to start MAZI was actually interactions with advocacy groups and this paper that was published in 2020 that associated 101 genes with autism spectrum disorders and neurodevelopmental disorders. And the reason I'm showing you this side of the slide is because what happened around that time, starting from 2017, 2018, all of a sudden, patients that did not have a genetic diagnosis were able to get a genetic diagnosis, and this is what happened. All these foundations came about. And these, and Charlene is here from STXVP1. I think Lisa's here as well. Um, all these foundations all of a sudden have a gene, they have a community, they have uh, the ability to move something forward for their gene. However, none of these foundations are, most of them are not started by drug developers. Most of them are not started by people who have gone through the process of taking a scientific discovery into the clinic and they face a lot of barriers. So what are the barriers that these patient groups actually face. So there is the financial barrier, as you all know. It costs a lot of money to take a drug into the clinic and get it approved. Most of the foundations can maybe, maybe start with the first bullet. They can fund basic research and get some animal proof of concept. They can raise maybe a half a million to two million dollars to do this. But most of them get stuck when it comes to IND enabling studies, when it comes to clinical studies, because the costs are just too, too, uh, too high to bear for a small patient group that just started out. The size of the community, critical. For those of us from the industry, we know that companies like to take patient populations that are very large. Obviously, diabetes, millions of patients, billions of patients, but going down to even the rare disease companies, the threshold is thousands of patients. So what happens when your community is only hundreds of patients? What do you do? How do you attract someone to even develop a drug on, that's uh, going to fix your disorder and your gene? It's very hard. The biology, the research, what is known about the, the protein that's mutated? Is, is, there, is there enough known? As we just heard, you need to understand the biology in order to develop a therapy. So do you need to fund basic research to understand what your gene and your protein actually do? Or do you assume that you can just go ahead and develop a therapy, and then can you restore normal function by just, just trying to fix it with a gene therapy or an ASO or gene editing? So all this is something that a new patient group, a new advocacy group has to think about and try to understand where do they, where do they start? And then, obviously, as I said, they don't have the expertise to develop therapies. So how do we break down the barriers? We break down the barriers by providing the advocacy group with guidance and support. We'll hear from Tanya from CZI, Charlene, Global Genes, Nord, and several other organizations that just help escort the new patient groups through the, through the process of formation towards drug development. We spend time educating the advocacy groups. We actually have a, what we call the Rare Entrepreneur Bootcamp. It's a three-day event where we teach advocates, parents, patients, what drug development is all about, try to get them to understand that it's not an instant success, it will take time to develop a drug, um, and also introduce them to the right people that might be able to help them develop a drug. We appeal to regulators. There is a, the FNIH and FDA initiative called the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium. There are specific guidances for rare diseases, but we're still far from being able to expedite and 
get therapies to patients in the speed and the, and the agility that we need to for these 10,000 disorders that were mentioned by Anna. And then we need to include ultra-rare disorders in our pipeline. So companies like Ultragenics, like Stoke, Ionis, and others do include ultra-rare disorders in their pipelines. The problem is the moment that you run out of money, your stock's dropping, the, the, most, the rarest disorders are the ones that are dro dropped out of the pipeline, and then the patients are left with the need to actually mobilize these therapies on their own. So this is the reason that we started MAZI. We wanted to create this infrastructure and environment that will allow ultra-rare disorders to advance therapies into the clinic. So we work very closely with patient groups, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, how we do, do so. And we also work very closely with academics, because what happens now is most of these advocacy groups, the moment they get the diagnosis, they Google the name of the gene, they go to PubMed, pull out the first 50, 50 papers who published on, the PIs who published on these genes, go to them and now ask them to help them develop a therapy. So most of the work is being funded initially by patient groups and advocacy groups, and from there we can actually take it, take over and translate it into the clinic. We're not a platform company. We use known technologies. We're not generating any novel IP from a platform perspective. We're not trying to develop the next generation AV. We're not doing any novel ASO chemistry. We're taking known technologies and trying to expedite therapies into the clinic as fast as possible. So this is a slide that I show patient groups when they come to me and ask, okay, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to attract industry? So we start with this pyramid, and the bottom of it is disease understanding, the community, how do you harness your community, and what are the tools that you need in order to, do so, to, to attract uh, an industry partner. So as I said before, try to get your numbers from hundreds to thousands if possible. Samantha here will tell you exactly what the prevalence of your mutation is, and then you'll be able to calculate how many patients are you actually looking for versus what you have. You start a registry. You start a natural history study if you have the resources. Uh, you survey the patients and the caregivers because you want to know what's important to the community and not what we think is important to design for, in order for us to be able to design clinical endpoints. And the community will help you also enroll in clinical trials eventually. Uh, from a disease understanding perspective, you, you're looking for meaningful clinical endpoints. Hopefully, you will be able to identify a, bi a biomarker that could be used in clinical trials, and you develop a disease concept model. The, the deepest understanding of the disorder will help you understand how to develop a trial, what, what's likely going to be the best clinical endpoint in a disorder that's never been in the clinic before in a clinical trial, and how would you be able to advance it, and what's the highest likelihood of succeeding in a clinical trial. Then you move to tools, patient cells organoids, biobank, animal models, what type of animal model. Uh, and, and these are all things that we try to get to guide advocacy groups through and say, this is something that you should be doing as a community. This is something that you should own. This is something that once you have it, it will attract industry partners and biotech partners to come and work with you because you've done the groundwork for them. So, and then they, the ownership will also give you the power to decide how your, how your disease is going to be treated, ideally. So this is what we do in the beginning, working with patient groups. And then we come in as a company, work with the advocacy groups to decide what the best modality is, and then take the programs into IND enabling studies, into clinical study, and hopefully approval. So this is Mozzie's current pipeline. You'll see it is really focused on ultra-rare disorders. Our lead disorder, currently known, 100, 150 patients in the world. It's a severe epileptic encephalopathy that's caused by mutations in the gene walks. Um, we estimate, based on experts' calculations, that there are about 3,000 to 5,000 patients worldwide. We're spending a lot of time looking for them because we want to, first of all, find every patient possible, but also make it a more 
sustainable disorder and potentially generate some profit or at least revenue on it. Uh, we're using a V9 and we hope to be in the clinic in 2024. The second is Pitt Hopkins. It's a transcription factor, TCF4 mutations, um, seizures, autism, epileptic encephalopathy, currently known around 1,000 to 1,200 patients worldwide, estimated 7,500, looking for them too. And the last one is CHD2, which is uh, an epigenetic modulator and uh, currently known around 500 patients. And what you will notice is that the three programs were in license from academics, uh, Hebrew University, UCSD, and the Weizmann Institute. This is work that was mostly funded by patient groups originally, and we came and licensed it from the universities. And hopefully, if we're successful, the patient groups will benefit not only from having a therapy, but also from having some royalty stream or some income into the patient group from the fact that they actually funded the original work. So I think my main message to all of us is that our goals, we're not, our goals are not aligned, but we do have to align them. If you have a family or a patient group, <laughs> they want us, us to cure their kids, they have a sense of urgency that we usually don't have. Uh, academics, tenure, publications, grants, Curing patients is not on the list when you sign up originally for most of the academics. For industry, we do want to change the world, but we need to make money while doing, but while doing it. So an ultra-rare disease doesn't always match the goals of a company. So how do we align? We need to uh, develop a therapy, hopefully find more patients, make it more attractive commercially, but also adhere to the sense of urgency that the families have and make sure that we expedite the development and get to the clinic as fast as we can. So in summary, it takes a village to develop therapies. We need to align. We have to manage expectations of the patient groups. Tell, they need to understand that not every drug will work. That's the way our industry works. We have failures, not only successes, but that we'll do our best in order to get a therapy for the kids or for the, patient, the older patients. Um, based on solid biology, smooth handovers from the academics to the company that's working on the, on the therapy. Parallel tracking, don't wait for something to happen to start the next thing. You have to do everything in parallel. Start the natural history study and the registry while you're looking for biomarkers and starting to think about clinical endpoints. Don't stall, you have to do everything at the same time. Collaborate closely and be very transparent when you're working with groups that have a very different set of expectations than yours. So I uh, hope all of you will develop therapies for rare diseases, ultra rare diseases, and walking out of here. And uh, thank you, and thank you for having me. So y'all, Henry would be proud of you focusing on the ultra rare disease space. So um, right now I'd like to introduce um, Daniel Fisher. He's the CEO, president, and co-founder of Travad Biosciences and a Tremir Fellow. Daniel co-founded Travad Biosciences to develop gene therapy approaches to cure Dravat uh, syndrome, a disease that affects his daughter Natasha and other rare diseases not amendable to traditional gene therapy approaches. Daniel brings together extensive management and entrepreneurial expertise to his role as CEO of Travad Biosciences. I would now like to welcome Daniel to share his journey as a rare disease parent and to CEO. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Belinda, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here in observance of Rare Disease Day. For my wife, Karina, for me, and for our four kids, rare is not that rare. See, our 13-year-old daughter, Natasha, uh, has Dravet syndrome. Dravet is a rare and very severe type of genetic epilepsy that affects about 1 in 15,000 
kids in the US. Kids with Dravet have many and very severe seizures. They have severe developmental and cognitive delays, high mortality rates, and other many issues. Uh, Natasha will have any given night between three, four, five um, tonic-clonic seizures, plus many other issues as well. So for us, it's not rare, and it's not one day. It's a very common occurrence that happens every single day. And as a family, we have to deal with it every single day. It affects not only the patient, not only the parents, it affects the family as a whole. And we families with rare diseases all come together and look of support. We very much support each other. But at the same time, we all deal with all the issues in our own personal and specific way. We all heal, we all find hope, we all cope with the situation in different ways, we all act in different ways. When we got the diagnosis of my daughter Natasha, the doctor says, okay, she has Dravet syndrome. And I don't come from a medical background, from a scientific background. I said, okay, so cure her. And the doctor says, oh no, sorry, there, there isn't anything that we can do about it. So one thing I tell every parent, don't ever pay attention to a doctor. Let me finish a sentence. <laughs> Let me finish a sentence. Don't take it out of context. When they tell you there's nothing you can do about it. There's always something that you can do about it. So in our case, what we did, uh, and I did what I do better. I started a company. By coincidence, one thing led me to a professor at Georgia Tech and a, and, an, and a wealthy individual at that time in Atlanta. And we decided to first uh, start a first company without knowing very well what we were doing. But at the end, actually, we set up a, a large screen to do drug repurposing first in silico and then in zebrafish models. And at the end, we ended up with a drug that actually made it to the clinic and is helping many patients uh, uh, today. However, Dravet, it's much more than only one of the manifestations, which, is, which are the seizures. If you'll ask any parent what's the biggest burden, it might not be the seizure. It's all everything that comes with it, the severe cognitive delays, behavioral issues, uh, all the uncertainty that you never know when a, when a seizure is going to happen. My, will my kid wake up in the morning or not? Um, we never know. So at the end, I decided that we wanted to continue doing research uh, for Joey. We actually wanted to cure the disease, not only find a small molecule that would help. So we then moved to Boston. There, was, there isn't much biotech happening in Atlanta, so we decided to move. And then this time with another father, of a child with Dravet, Warren Lambert. We went to somebody that many of you are probably familiar with, uh, Harvey Lodish. Uh, I went to Harvey. I, I had met Harvey because he has a personal story with uh, his grandchild, which uh, was cured uh, by a drug that Harvey developed many years ago when he co-founded uh, co founded Genzyme. Um, uh, me being very ignorant, I go to Harvey. I said, Harvey, do you know anything about you know, gene therapy and genetics? He looks at me, yeah, yeah, I know a, a, a thing or two about that. So at that time, I said, Harvey, can you help me think about a way of doing a, a type of gene therapy for Dravet, knowing that Dravet is caused by mutations, loss of function in the SCN1A gene, which is a very large gene, so you can't deliver it with an AV vector. Also, Dravet, it's a, it's a Goldilocks gene, so you can't overexpress it. If not, it's also deleterious. And it's caused by many different types of mutations. So Harvey said, sure, let's think about it. So we thought about it. And then and then we decided to start Tavart Biosciences. Our original goal was to reverse Ravet. That's where the name Tavart uh, comes from. So what we're currently doing at Tavart, we're pioneering, pioneering tRNA as a therapeutic. And what we're doing, if you think about the, the central dogma, we're modulating mRNA function using tRNAs with two goals in mind. One is to restore a full-length protein in those cases where it's been truncated by a nonsense mutation. In Dravet, about 25% of all cases are caused by premature stop codons, including uh, my daughter. Other diseases like uh, Duchenne muscle dystrophy is about 15%, and some diseases like Rett syndrome, 40% of all cases 
are caused by non-switch mutation. Our other goal is to um, restore protein levels up to wild type in haplon sufficient diseases where you might have only 50% of uh, protein levels, which is not enough for uh, healthy functioning of the, of the patient. So even if we started with Dravé, since then we realized that actually we have several platforms that uh, allow us to tackle uh, indications in a much broader space. On one hand, we can uh, treat most cases of uh, within diseases caused by non such mutations. We can also address most haplon sufficient disorders. And really where our sweet spot is, is within those two buckets. For those diseases are not amenable for traditional gene therapy because they either have a, a large gene which you can deliver or it's a, go, a, a Goldilocks gene where you need very precise levels of expression or it's caused by many different types of mutation and using tip, uh, typical gene editing techniques becomes very uh, impractical. And tRNA therapeutics have many advantages over other approaches. Some key advantages, um, we deliver tRNAs, which with its uh, flanking sequences and everything, there are about 200 bases, uh, the gene. So you can deliver, uh, it's easy to deliver tRNAs using AV vectors or LMPs. So the size of the gene that you're trying to address that you're targeting becomes uh, irrelevant. Uh, one of the other uh, therapeutics, the, the suppressor approach, actually you can use the same construct, the same drug, to treat different genes, uh, different conditions, which is pretty uncommon for a gene therapy uh, treatment. And probably the most important thing about it is that you can restore gene expression within a very narrow window and only in the cells that uh, express the gene. Like Yael said, it takes a village. I've been fortunate enough to have many people supporting me in our journey. I only went up to them and asked. I told them my story. They said, if it's to cure a child, yes, I'm in. Some faces that you might recognize, of course, Harvey, Paul Schimmel at MIT, um, David Liu, Ben Deverman at the Broad, and uh, many others as well. There's been quite a bit of interest in the last uh, few years, and uh, two other companies have uh, appeared also working on tRNA therapeutics. So we believe that uh, the future of tRNA-based therapies is uh, bright. Um, I'm not going to talk science. I, I wouldn't try to do that in front of everybody here. I'm not a scientist, but uh, let me show one of our platforms. So what we, what we do, remember, in Dravé, 25% of cases are caused by nonsense mutations in one copy of the SCN1A gene, which encodes for a voltage-graded sodium channel. So you have one healthy copy, only 50% levels of protein, so the kids are, are ill. Uh, in theory, if you can increase up to 75% of wild type levels of the protein, you can have a much milder uh, phenotype of the patient. So what we do in this case, we, as you know, there aren't any natural occurring uh, tRNAs that would read a premature stop codon. So what we do, we modify the anticodon so we can get it uh, to read uh, premature stop codon and insert the right amino acid in the polypeptide chain. So in theory, you're producing full-length protein from a mutated gene. Um, probably everybody has a question, well, but it's going to read over the natural termination codon too. Well, it doesn't. Um, if you want the explanation, ask Harvey. <laughs> uh, why? Uh, so in essence, what we're doing, we're taking uh, a non-functional, mutated copy of the gene, and by reading through the premature stop codon, we're restoring full function, and we're restoring uh, full protein. From results that we've gotten in mice, where we have uh, quite a bit of data and in vivo proof of concept, we're able to get to 80% of uh, wild type uh, protein levels, which is more than enough for uh, uh, um, recovering the, the phenotype in the Dravet mice, which have a very severe phenotype and very similar to, to the kids. Um, an example of diseases, so the, the, the opportunities are limitless. You could actually treat uh, most types of diseases. At the end, probably the limiting factor is can you deliver uh, to that tissue or not? That's, uh, uh, probably the um, 
the defendant factor. But if you think about it, I mean, of course, epilepsy, our, our lead indication is Dravet. The beauty of Dravet that uh, having a, a lead candidate, we can then expand with the same candidate, the same drug into other epilepsies caused by non sense mutations with a goal of doing a, a, a basket a clinical trial for uh, more efficiency, um, easily expanding into other CNS indications. Delivery is very similar. The suppressor and promoters are similar. Diseases like BAT and, and RET. Um, we've been looking and working in cardiology as well. If you think about it, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy caused by Titan. Titan is the largest protein in the body and not many approaches would work. The tRNA approaches since the size of the gene is irrelevant, you can easily target it. And DMD uh, as well. So just to finish, um, I'm happy to announce that we, we have just signed a very exciting partnership to work on one and potentially other rare diseases. So stay tuned for tomorrow, Rare Disease Day, when it's going to be announced. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, and again, it takes a village. Um, very helpful to my team at uh, Tavard and every collaborator, everybody that uh, contributes, that listens to our story uh, for your support. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. And I know that there will be a lot of questions. And hopefully, during the Q&A, we will have some um, time for that. OK. okay the next speaker is Tanya Simoncelli, who is uh, the Vice President of Science and Society for the Chan Zuckerberg uh, Initiative. Um, Tanya is amazing in many ways. But I would say that the most incredible thing about Tanya that maybe some of you know or some of you do not know is that she was instrumental in something that we now take completely for granted. Um, prior to 2013, some individuals had the idea that maybe we should patent genes, and that therefore they would belong to someone instead of this information belonging to all of us. So in uh, uh, 2013, I think, uh, Tanya was named uh, by Nature as one of the 10 people who mattered most this year because she spearheaded the development of ACLU's successful legal challenge to patenting genes, right? Something that, again, today we take for granted. Um, since then, uh, Tanya had a remarkable career. She served as Assistant Director for Forensic Science and Biomedical Innovation in the uh, White House Office for Science and Technology. She then became a Brody, uh, worked here a senior advisor to the director for a few years. And then the CZI uh, snatched her up and recruited her out to um, San Francisco, uh, where she now serves as the vice president of science and society. She has done amazing things with Rare is One, which I'm, we're about to hear uh, more about. And I'm so grateful, Tanya, that you made it here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Anna. That was <laughs> very sweet. And I'm just such an honor to be here today for Rare Disease Day. Um, where is the clicker? Oh, here we go. Um, so I'm going to talk, as Anna mentioned, a little bit about um, the Rare is One project at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, and in particular, some of what we've learned um, over the last three years in working directly with patient communities um, and really learning from those communities as they work to accelerate um, research in their disease areas. Um, so for those of you not familiar with this program and with CZI, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is a philanthropic organization founded by Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan following the birth of their first child, Max, uh, with a mission to build a better future for their daughter's generation. And um, Mark and Priscilla really aimed to create a very different sort of philanthropic organization. Um, they wanted to figure out how they could leverage a combination of uh, not just funding, but also science and technology and community-driven solutions and collaboration to address complex societal problems. Um, so as Anna mentioned, I lead our science and society program at CZI, which is part of our science initiative. Um, and our science initiative has an incredibly bold mission, which is to cure, prevent, or manage all disease by the end of the century. And in science and society, we believe that um, a really essential um, 
uh, component for our work and for getting to that goal is to actually work to bring science closer to the communities that it ultimately aims to serve, and especially patient communities. We really believe that we cannot achieve this mission of curing, managing, or preventing disease unless we actually elevate patients as central stakeholders and partners in research. So our Rare is One project um, was really born out of a recognition of that, of what I just said, basically, um, but that it's that patients are not only important to engage in research, but they're actually more and more taking on roles of actively driving research forward. And they can be enormously powerful research drivers, including by building strong, trusted patient communities, uh, by articulating disease insights that are critical uh, for generating hypotheses and informing research priorities, um, by galvanizing collaboration and actually helping to break down research silos um, across the re uh, research community, um, by building research-enabling infrastructure um, that we just heard a little bit about, um, uh, things like standing up registries and biobanks and disease models um, that facilitate research and help to de-risk um, investments um, in disease areas, and by directly partnering in and also funding research directly. Um, and we observed that this model of patient-driven research is especially critical for accelerating progress in rare diseases that are not well served by traditional academic research approaches and where incentives to study those diseases um, and to develop treatments for those diseases are too few without patients actually leading the way. Um, so in 2019, uh, we launched our Rare as One project. Um, and some of you have heard a little bit of, of uh, at least in this audience, because I know you, <laughs> some of you, um, have heard a lot about our Rares One network. But, and that is actually the core and the foundation for the program. And that's where we're working directly with and learning aside a network of rare disease organizations um, as they work to accelerate progress in their disease areas. But we have other components of the program that are really sort of interlocking with and actually really informed by the network, which we really see as the really the foundation, we really take seriously Mark and Priscilla's idea of really learning directly from communities that are actually impacted by the problems we're trying to solve. Um, so we also fund patient-partnered research. So we have a, a, a series of grants um, that we give in, in, that are actually supporting um, uh, projects where uh, researchers and patients are coming together as partners in research. So for example, uh, right here at the Broad, actually it was, my, my, I think it was actually the first uh, grant that we funded in this space was to the Rare Genomes Project here at the Broad Institute that's partnering directly uh, with undiagnosed patients and their families to improve access to genomic research and shorten the diagnostic odyssey, especially for underserved populations. Um, so um, in addition, we work to develop tools and roadmaps and resources that support the ability of patient communities to drive progress in their disease areas. And then thirdly, we provide support to the broader rare disease ecosystem. Um, so for example, through support to some of the rare disease umbrella organizations and others that have been diligently working to support um, the, a, a broadening rare disease uh, movement um, around the world. So our Rares One network to date has supported 50 patient-led rare disease organizations across two cycles to develop the foundational capacity to engage as partners and to center patient priorities in research. These organizations are funded at a level of $600,000 over three years to, um, with sort of three primary goals, um, to build and strengthen a collaborative research network in their disease areas, bringing together patients and researchers and clinicians, um, to host at least one international scientific convening and to align their community through the development of a prioritized research agenda. Now notice we didn't fund the groups to fund research. And one of the things that we learned in um, developing this program where some very like, rare disease organizations, especially in ultra rare spaces, would come, would find out and get a diagnosis and go out and think, oh my gosh, how do I accelerate research? And sort of fund the one researcher they know, they knew in the disease area. And that's not necessarily, that's fine, but it's not necessarily funding the right research at the right time. So we really wanted to help these groups learn how to sort of step back take the time, build their community, and really understand the state of the research in their disease areas. We thought that was a really critical um, model um, to, to, to build the program on. Um, 
so we also recognized that funding was necessary, but it was really not sufficient for supporting these groups. Um, no one plans to be a patient leader in rare disease. Most of these leaders do not come to these roles uh, with formal scientific training, as we just heard. Uh, most have not previously run nonprofit organizations either. Um, so um, at the average budgets of our Rare as One network um, groups in our first cohort was around $300,000, and the vast majority had no paid staff. Um, so we set out to design an incubator style program um, that would help build the capacities of organizations to optimize their efforts and sustain themselves well beyond the grant period. So in addition to funding, our program offers organizational and scientific capacity building support through regular training and coaching opportunities and things like organizational development and management and finance and operations, mentorship um, and science advising and um, also opportunities to really share with one another and collaborate with one another through monthly community calls and convenings, an online portal and a newsletter, um, and opportunities to co-develop and to access um, shared tools. Um, so before I go into the, um, the, what we've learned from the network and some of the um, progress they've made, I want to say just a word about a really special collaboration that we have with the network, and we're actually looking for more and more ways to do this, where we actually um, de co-develop tools between other entities and, um, and our network organizations. So we've had, for the last two years, a partnership with the Rare Genomes Project um, to develop a web-based prevalence calculator tool for estimating prevalence for autosomal recessive conditions. So RGP has been working with a, directly with a subset of our grantees in our Rare as One network to calculate their disease um, gene prevalence for their diseases, perform loss of function curation, and aid in molecular diagnoses of undiagnosed community members in those groups. Um, and to date, they've um, developed prevalence estimates for 13 genes involved in 12 diseases and curated 789 variants. And this is, I think, a really powerful example of what we're here to talk about today, which is patient partner research, where we've seen really clear evidence of bi-directional learning and value between the, the RGP team and our Rares One network groups. So the research team has reported that insights of the patients um, into their diseases and their connections to disease experts have been really critical for them in interpret interpreting the results of their analyses. And the patient groups um, have been really very quickly able to leverage the results of the study to inform their outreach strategies um, for identifying patients in their disease areas and educating the clinical community, um, and prioritizing variants for functional studies or drug development. So this is just a, one example, and um, one of the exciting things about this network is it's kind of creating a space where we can incubate and experiment with different tools and approaches, and um, um, it's just a project I'm, I love, and I think the, I'm looking at Sam, she's beaming in the front seat, I think she loves it too. She's part of the Rare Genomes Project team. Um, okay, so now to the accomplishments of our um, Rare as One grantees. So as I mentioned, we have two cycles of grantees that we funded. The first cycle was 30 patient-led rare disease organizations. Um, all of them, nearly all of the groups achieved the three main goals that I laid out. All 30 developed or significantly expanded their research networks, all hosted at least one scientific convening, and 28 out of 30 of them developed a research roadmap or a prioritized research agenda over the three-year period. Um, but what's exciting is actually the more detailed um, accomplishments where you can see that they made progress well beyond the core objectives under the grant. So collectively, the 30 groups um, in cycle one sub substantively engaged nearly 600 researchers from around the world. They held or planned 74 scientific communities, uh, convenings. They funded or partnered in 135 research projects. They stood up 24 registries and 19 biobanks. They co-authored or were acknowledged in 15 publications. They engaged 65 industry partners and they launched 17 clinical trials in just three years. And I also want to remind everyone, this was the middle of 1919, I mean 2019 to, 20, to 22. So like during the, the peak of the pandemic um, where a lot of research was actually slowed down in many spaces. So just to highlight one example 
Um, to, in 2016, KIF1A.org was founded by Luke Rosen and Sally Jackson after their daughter, Susanna, um, was diagnosed with KIF1A associated neurological disorder, or CAND. CAND is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder caused by gain of function mutations in the KIF1A gene. Um, children with this disorder typically develop very severe epilepsy, brain and optic nerve atrophy, movement disorder, spastic paraplegia, and intellectual disability and autism. Um, the disease was actually identified in 2011 at the time, um, at that time, um, at the time that Luke and Sally founded KIF1A um, in .org in 2016, there were still only 10 patients known to have this disease um, and only a couple of researchers working in the space. Um, I don't need to go through all the details on the slide, but the, the upshot is that the outlook of this situation is completely different now, six years later since the founding of that organization. So at the end of 2022, you can see that the community really has completely transformed the research landscape for this disease. So KIF1A today is a community of more than 500 patients from around the world. They've engaged a collaborative research community of more than 60 academic institutions and industry partners They've created a, an incredibly robust toolkit that's available to the scientific community. A lot of the things that Yael was saying uh, groups need to create. So they have a patient registry, a detailed natural history. They have IPSC lines, animal models. They have more than 160 families enrolled in their natural history study. And they've launched, importantly, they've launched a multi-pronged therapeutic strategy uh, with formal partnerships focused on gene therapy, AI drug discovery, and high throughput screening. Um, and they also, um, uh, there's also an N of one trial currently underway to test a novel ASO therapy that was developed for their uh, Susanna, the daughter of the founders of this organization that they developed in collaboration with the NLARM Foundation and Wendy Chung at Columbia University. Now this is like, this is amazing. I mean, in six years, this amount of progress, no one can tell me that this could have happened without the work of the foundation really paving the way and really driving these collaborations and really creating these research enabling assets. And I think this is what we really want to see all of our groups do in the Rare as One Network. Um, actually, many of them are doing this. This is just one example is what I should be saying. Um, so overall, I think what we're seeing from this program is that with modest support, patient-led rare disease organizations can really have outsized impact in their disease areas. We're also seeing that building strong networked community is absolutely essential foundation for accelerating progress, and that researchers are really eager to engage with these research, these patient communities. We heard from many, many researchers over the last three years that their work is actually, they think their work is better um, because of their patient partnerships and, and the actual working with the patients has actually really informed their research and some of the directions that they've taken in their research. But probably the biggest value of this program, I think, is actually the network effect um, that we're really seeing in bringing these groups together and um, creating space for them to work together. These groups are identifying interesting synergies across their diseases, they're sharing approaches, and they're sharing, and like that has, I think in some ways they're learning more from one another than they're learning from our, you know, um, the programs that we're, we're, we're providing them with capacity building support. Um, and, you know, there's no question that sustainability is a challenge for these groups. Um, but the other thing we see that is, you know, a couple of paid staff go a really long way to catapulting these organizations to be able to make real lasting progress in their disease areas. And so that is not, you know, that is not millions of dollars. That's like something that is actually a modest amount of funds can make a huge difference. And I hope that's something that other funders will start to recognize that by funding these groups with modest amounts of money, we can actually make way more progress in rare disease if we can work together. Um, so just a word on future directions. Um, I really um, think that um, we're in a position where we really want to replicate and scale our incubator approach. We think it's working. We think it's exciting. Um, we'd love everybody's um, input and thoughts on um, other ways we, can, we should be thinking about this, other trainings, other supports that groups need. We're really excited to continue to get a lot of feedback from our current um, grantees, and we're constantly iterating the program. Um, 
I think um, we also see the value of the network approach and by to optimize that, we're building out an alumni program right now. So once you're in our network, you're always in our network, we're gonna look for ways to continue to work with groups even after they exit the sort of the, the funding cycle. Um, looking for ways they can both give back to the program and sort of pay it forward to the next groups, but also ways that they can continue to learn and engage. Um, and we're also really looking at ways we can sort of double down on patient partnered research. Um, and last month, we kicked off um, a cohort of 10 patient partnered research teams that we funded through two RFAs that we launched last year, teams that are made up of researchers, clinicians and patient leaders working to advance research in rare neurodegenerative diseases and rare pediatric inflammatory diseases. And so I'm really excited to see where that program um, goes, but I think that um, I'm hoping that we'll be doing more and more of that um, out of CZI. Um, so I will close there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. Um, so for our next speaker, um, Eric Pierce. Um, Eric is the William Chatless Professor of Ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School, and he's the director of the um, Harvard Ocular Genomics Institute at the Mass Eye and Ear. Uh, what I can say about Eric is that he's really the quintessential physician scientist uh, in my mind. Uh, he really, I think, will tell you about his work both um, um, studying bas basic mechanisms in the lab, but also then taking some of that into patients with some of the most pioneering approaches in treating um, ocular diseases in the eye with gene therapies. Uh, I think it's really at the forefront of what we all hope to accomplish, and it's really a great pleasure to have you here to speak to us today. Thank you, Eric. Thanks very much. Anna, thank you for that very kind introduction, and thank you all for being here. It's an exciting day. I'm gonna to try to tell you a little bit about the therapeutic landscape for inherited retinal degenerative disorders, as Anna mentioned. Um, I get to point out some disclosures and also get to thank the wonderful group of investigators at the Ocular Genomics Institute that I get to work with every day. We think of the Ocular Genomics Institute as a translational research institute, and I'm supposed to be able to point this at the screen here, yeah, it'll work, wonderful. Um, we really focus on our patients with eye diseases and use that to help understand the genetics of the diseases that patients have understand how mutations and genes we discover lead to disease, and use that information to develop therapies that we want to bring back to our patients. And the exciting thing about our field right now is that that's happening, as I'm gonna to try to tell you. So while the Ocular Genomics Institute is focused on inherited eye disease in general, my focus is on inherited retinal degenerations, so what are those? These are disorders where mutations and genes that are required for vision damage the light-sensitive cells in the retina, leading to vision loss. So if you start out with a normal retina here, and see if I can, oops, I just went forward. I wanna do this instead. Here's a normal retina, the optic nerve here in the center of the retina, the macula, and that all looks healthy, and it underlies healthy normal vision with good visual field. The anatomy here is a cross-section of the retina taken with light, a technique called optical coherence tomography. The light-sensitive cells are this dark layer here, and you can tell that's continuous all the way across. And you don't need to be a trained ophthalmologist to know Something's different here, right? Look, looks different. That's because the light sensitive cells at the edges of the, this image have been lost. And they're only really left in the very center right here. And that shows people still have central vision, but they've lost their peripheral vision. They often have night blindness associated with this. So, what we'd like to be able to do is develop therapies that would at least maintain these light sensitive cells in the center, because although people have trouble, they can manage with some central vision. We don't want this to progress to all the cells being lost and no vision. Fortunately, gene and genetic therapies are being developed successfully for these disorders. I'm gonna tell you about one of those briefly. Most of this is AAV-based gene augmentation therapy, which can work for about 80% of inherited retinal disease genes and works very well in the retina. Because many patients also have mutations in large genes or have dominant disease for which gene augmentation isn't gonna work, we're also exploring CRISPR-Cas9 mediated gen genome editing and antisense oligonucleotide therapies. And I'll get, tell you about one example of our work with CRISPR-Cas9 therapies. These are being provided by subretinal or intravitreal injection, so it's a local therapy in the eye which has some advantages. So the first kind of proof of concept that gene therapy for inherited retinal diseases works comes from treating a disease called RP65-associated retinal degeneration, mutations in the RP65 gene. Clinical trials of this gene therapy were started in 2007 in Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, led by 
Gene Bennett and Al McGuire, and I was very excited and honored to be part of that team. That work led to approval of this drug as the first approved gene therapy in the United States for an inherited disorder in 2017 and in Europe in 2018. And what was one of the things that's interesting that I'd like to point out here that echoes this part of this concept of patients as partners is that this was not approved based on the standard metric that the FDA uses to assess the effect of drugs for eye disease, which is the improvement of someone's vision in three lines on an eye chart. When we did this clinical trial, that we realized that it wasn't happening in the patients that we treated. What they were experiencing was reversal of their night blindness. They could see better when lights were dimmer or low. So Jean Bennett, being the brilliant investigator that she is, teamed up with some of the folks on our team and in our conference room at the F.M. Kirby Center at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center, she developed a multi-luminance mobility test in which, it's just an easier to point here, um, we asked patients, hopefully, there you go, uh, we asked patients to walk a maze, which they could do, and the difference was we did it under different conditions of illumination. So they might be able to do it pre-treatment when the lights were bright, but they couldn't do it when the lights were turned down. But we measured this very carefully under different levels of illumination and scored it basically on how much they could do when the lights were dim. And here's the data that led to approval of this drug, now called Luxterna by the FDA. You can see in the blue lines, patients treated in the initial group of the study had improvements. They could do the maze under lower levels of light, and that was sustained. Patients in the crossover group who were observed for a year also improved following treatment. So a novel endpoint led to approval of this drug. That has led to deployment of gene and genetic therapies for multiple different forms of inherited retinal degeneration. This is just getting started. As I said, there are 280 different forms of these diseases. We have a lot of work to do. The therapies for 10 of them are now in clinical trials, and we're also in clinical trials for some of the other therapeutic approaches as shown. This is led mainly by two wonderful colleagues at Mass Ioneer. Rachel Huckfeldt is really our clinical trialist, and Jason Commander, who does the surgeries to do the subretinal and intravitreal injections. I want to tell you briefly about one of our current clinical trials, which I happen to be leading, um, which is a clinical trial of, gene, of CRISPR Cas9 mediated genome editing for one form of inherited retinal degeneration. And I'm going to start by telling you about the patient that I've been following, one of the patients I've been following with this disorder. This is PD. She's now a 19 year old in college, which is hard for me to believe because I met her when she was an infant. And her parents brought her to see us at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia because she couldn't see. She had nystagmus, meaning her eyes wobbled. She could really only detect if the lights were on and off. You can tell by looking at her retina that there's some degeneration of the retina. Out here, I think the color doesn't look quite right. But in the center, it doesn't look too bad. And actually, there are light sensitive cells, again, if I can get this to work, still on her OCT. So the light sensitive cells are there, but they don't work. She's not using them, she can't see with them. So it seems like there's structure function dissociation. If we could treat those cells and restore some function, maybe we could improve her vision even a little bit. So we studied the genetic cause of her disease, and I'm uh, sorry it's been cut off on this particular slide. She has two mutations in the gene CEP290, including one that's a common mutation in intron 26 that turns out to be a good target for CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing because it's a deep intronic mutation. Here it is between exons 26 and 27, devitronic mutation that activates the inclusion of a cryptic exon that's out of frame, leading to a loss of functional view. So if you could devise a way to cut that out, you could restore normal gene function. And that's what Editas did. They developed their drug called Edit 101, which encodes the components you need for CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. You needed guide RNA to direct a Cas9 nucleotase to, Cas9 nuclease to a specific site in the genome where it can cut. And the guide RNAs that were developed here work very well to cut out or cause inversion of this segment of intron 26 where this mutation is and restore normal function. So this is the program Editas brought to clinical trials. Um, when tested in patient cells or, or organized in the lab, it reverses the ratio of wild type to mutant so that wild type protein in RNA is more prevalent. It can be, this can be accomplished in in vivo animal models using doses of AAV, of this edit 101 AAV that encodes the guide RNAs and the Cas9 nuclease. 
that are normally provided in gene therapy trials. And it can do that and produce effective editing in ranges which we thought might be therapeutically effective. So these are the doses chosen for the clinical trial. And very importantly, Editas, I think, did a fabulous job testing whether these guide RNAs are specific for the location in the genome that they're targeted to, or whether they might have off-target activity and cut somewhere else they're not supposed to. And in a short talk like this, I don't have time to go through all that data, but I think Editas really set the standard for how thorough you need to be to show that your guide RNAs don't have off-target activity, and that's what they demonstrated. So that led to a clinical trial, and it's very exciting to be part of one of the first clinical trials of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing that's being done in patients' bodies in vivo. There are six of these trials now registered with clinicaltrials.gov. The IND for the Brilliance trial of the SEP290 gene editing was actually the first one issued. There's actually been positive results reported from one other of these in vivo trials for transthyretin amyloidosis, and we're going to hopefully be reporting the results of the SEP290 Brilliance trial shortly, and I've got permission from Editas to tell you a little bit about the data from that study. So the Brilliance study design is a very typical dose escalation, phase one, two, first in human study. Three adult cohorts with increasing doses of AAV, edit 101. Two pediatric cohorts with a two middle and high dose. The main inclusion criterion is obviously having the genetic form of disease that this therapy is directed towards, the intron 26 mutation. The key endpoints, really, the, this is a phase one, two, first in human study. Safety is a key one here. And then if we're lucky, maybe some early signs of efficacy. So can patients see better? Do they see better when the lights are dim? Can they navigate a course better? And do they believe, do they do a patient-reported outcome that their vision's better? There are 14 subjects enrolled in the trial, ranging from ages 9 to 63. The vision these patients have is, what's, is measured on average at LOGMAR 2.4. Logmar is the logarithm of the minimal angle of resolution that people can see. If you have 20-20 vision, your Logmar score is zero. If you have 2200 vision, which is the definition of legal blindness, your Logmar score is one. These patients, on average, have a Logmar score of 2.4. So it's much worse than legal blindness. It means they could maybe see a hand moving in a normally lit room in an exam center setting, such as an eye exam. So we're starting with patients who have severe visual impairment. And we're really just asking, do we see safety? And is there early efficacy? The safety profile was actually quite good. Again, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go through all the details. But there's no dose-limiting toxicity and no serious adverse events, SAEs, related to eye, the eyes themselves. As in any clinical trial, there were certainly adverse events. Some of them were adverse events of special interest related to inflammation we saw under the retina following injection of AAV. That's been seen in other settings. But the safety profile overall is quite good. So it always amazes me when I see a slide in which we've summarized the data of years and years of work, then it's one slide. <laughs> this is the data where Editas is currently allowing us to show. The rows are the 14 subjects enrolled in the trial. And the thing to focus on is the blue highlights are positive results. When a patient reported they could see better, or when we measured they could see better. And just as one example, there are eight, eight of the patients felt they could see better after treatment. That includes PD, the subject that I mentioned to you earlier on. And, eight, and six of those eight have corresponding measures, ob objective measures of improvement in their vision, either seeing better or seeing better under conditions of reduced illumination. To me, that's a great success, right? First in human study, first time we're trying CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing in someone's eye. And we have evidence of biological editing, right? CRISPR-Cas9 is being produced. Editing is occurring. Septic 90 protein is being made. And we're seeing the result of that in improved vision. And it can be done relatively safely. So I think this is a huge success. And I hope this means we're going to be able to use CRISPR-Cas9-based CRISPR therapies for many other eye diseases and hopefully many other inherited diseases in general. Sorry, the picture didn't come out. I want to thank, the, obviously, the patients and families who participated in the study. I'll get back to that in a second. And the other investigative sites around the country. And there's supposed to be a map of the US there that didn't show up. And what I really point, want to point out is how important the partnerships that we develop with our patients are for these clinical trials. As I mentioned, I've known PD for 19 years. 
that partnership is critically important because she motivates our research. And I think our relationship gave her the confidence to enroll in this clinical trial. Those are very important partnerships. And another is, another uh, participant in another one of our clinical trials had mugs made for all of the clinical trial team at Mass Pioneer. And when she made them, she had her face on the astronaut's face here. And she says, Pioneer. And she's really right. The patients who participate in these first in human trials or these end of one studies are pioneers. And we need to partner with them so they can be pioneers. And the pi they're just as important in terms of pioneers as people who went to the moon. So I think this mug just super captures this super well. OK, so a little reality check. I think this is a great success. And you may have heard, some of you at least, that Editas decided to halt this trial. It's a tough time in investments. They made a business decision to stop the study. Editas has been a fabulous partner to work with for the past nine years on this, this and other programs. And I wish them all their best. And moving forward, they're going to focus on hemoglobinopathies going forward. But what do we do now? We have a very promising therapeutic. We want to bring it to our rare disease patients. What happens next? And again, I hope this is a place where there's, again, the emphasis you've heard about partnerships with patient-built and patient-centered organizations might help here. And this is just an example. So I've been associated with the Foundation Fighting Blindness, a patient organization related to inherited retinal disorders for many years. They formed, a number of years ago, the RD Fund, which is a venture philanthropy fund to create small companies or su support small companies developing therapeutics for inherited retinal degeneration. I have no idea if Editas is going to partner with them. I hope Editas is talking to lots of people, lots of companies about potential partnerships. But they could partner with Opus Genetics. And I think that actually might have a good success of success, bringing this therapeutic now to phase three trials, because I really think this could be registered. And I think it could work because this is venture philanthropy supported. So it's a little insulated from market forces, at least financial market forces. And it's very patient driven. So it's more focused on the mission of getting therapeutics to patients. So I hope Editas finds a partner like Opus or another that allows us to get to phase three trials for this drug. So I hope I've convinced you that gene genetic therapy show great promise for treating inherited retinal disorders. We're certainly excited about them. I think I've also shown, as some of the other speakers have discussed, that clinical development of these drugs can be challenging because of the rareness of their disease, and that patient and mission-driven companies and efforts might facilitate drug development in this area, because we have to do this, because all of our patients are counting on us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. While all the panelists are making their way up uh, to their seats, I'm going to introduce Sam Baxter. And please come up to, to your seats. Uh, and then she will run the show from there. So anyone who's done anything with uh, genes and genetic diseases has used uh, Nomad, has been perhaps aware of the Rare Genomes Project at the Broad, uh, knows about the Gregor Consortium. Anything that has to do with the Broad and genetics or genomics is touched by Sam in some way. Uh, so Sam Baxter is the Associate Director uh, for Genetic and Genomic Data Sharing and a Genetic Counselor in the Program in Medical and Population Genetics and Translational Genomics um, at the Broad Institute. Um, she works very um, uh, closely with Heidi Reem, who I know many of you know, and, and Anne O'Donnell. Um, and they really make all of this magic happen, uh, these uh, incredible resources that all investigators in our community are using. Um, and also um, has been partnered, as um, Tanya also mentioned, with uh, CCI. And I think maybe some of those things can come up during um, the conversation. So um, Sam Baxter is really a force behind a lot of our uh, work here uh, in partnership with patients. And so it seemed only fit that she would moderate this incredible panel of amazing um, scientists and advocates um, and uh, biotech leaders. And so, Sam, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, 
I now feel okay getting to have the first couple questions to this amazing set of speakers. So um, I wanted to start quickly with giving Charlene the opportunity to also introduce herself since uh, you heard from the rest of our panelists uh, during their talks. So I'll have everybody remind you of their names, not that any of these people need to be uh, named again, but I wanted to give Charlene the opportunity to introduce herself a little bit uh, as we start off this discussion. Hello. Oh, great. Hi, I'm Charlene Senrigby, and I'm the CEO of Global Genes, um, which is a nonprofit organization focused on supporting and enabling uh, rare disease patients and advocates. And I'm relatively new to the nonprofit space. I've actually spent my career building and commercializing software solutions for analyzing healthcare data. And um, so my last commercial company uh, developed AI for accelerating rare disease diagnosis through interrelating phenotype and genotype information. And um, ironically, my second child was born right before I joined this company. And um, she started missing milestones when she was four months old. And and that led us to on a three-year diagnostic journey to figure out was what was going on with Juno. And um, we were very lucky in that uh, we finally were able to get an answer through whole exome sequencing, which was ironic because I was working in the genomic um, testing uh, arena, but we were trying to do this through clinical testing. Um, and that opened up um, you know, kind of the whole world of rare disease to me in a very kind of direct and personal way. Um, at, so my daughter was diagnosed with STXBP1-related uh, disorder. There were, in 2016, about 200 patients known in the world. And we were um, really lucky, so after going through the 12 stages of grief, or however many there are, um, we found five other families who wanted to start a foundation for uh, with us. And so we're, our focus with the STXBP1 Foundation was to accelerate therapies and you know, really to start, to kickstart research in our area. There were about five researchers who had been interested in STXBP1 at the time. And you know, so as we're developing this foundation, we started to work on you know, collecting data. And I was realizing as we were talking to other groups that a lot of advocacy organizations, we were all doing something different. And you know, if I put my software uh, architect hat on, I kept thinking, how can we do this in a more scalable way? Like, you know, we're slogging through this. Everybody's slogging through this. Isn't there a way to raise all boats? And so I um, met the uh, group at RareX um, in 2021, and I was really so delighted that this is the problem that they were trying to solve. And I ended up leaving industry and going um, full time into nonprofit to really focus on building, you know, robust data across disorders to really lay the groundwork for natural history studies and trials. And we just merged with uh, Global Genes at the end of 2022. So I'm excited about this kind of broader remit. And one of the themes that I have heard really in everyone's talks around this partnering with patients, and you know, especially I loved Yale's um, pyramid, um, advocacy today is not what it was 15 years ago. And you know, so many things have accelerated, you know, like the the what we have um, to work with in terms of technology for developing therapies. Um, this tail that's happened um, in terms of in terms of disorders that um, I think you had in your slide that uh, that I really loved. So you know, over 10,000 disorders and so many of them in the ultra rare area and. There are so many more tools for advocacy for people to build their communities. And so what we have at Global Genes have been talking a lot about is this next generation of advocacy and how do we enable advocates because they do want to be true partners and have you know, the capabilities and it's a question of really filling out um, the pieces and to, uh, to enable them to be full partners. Thank you, I think that was wonderful and summarized a lot of the things that uh, the other speakers were speaking to. So, um, uh, as Anna gave everybody uh, in my intro, I wear a lot of different hats at the Broad, and you're not usually supposed to pick your favorites, but everybody who I work with is very aware of my favorite pro uh, project, which is the Prevalence Study, where we partner directly with uh, the Rare is One patient organizations. Um, this project actually came out of originally working with pharmaceutical companies, but it was through meeting two rare um, disease moms 
who one just happened to live down the street from me, the other one was a whole 20 miles away, um, that I realized the, the uh, promise of doing the prevalence study with patient organizations directly. Um, and so this has been something that's very special to my heart and has really um, taken my career to being more than a career, but really a mission and something that keeps us going even in the 2020 time where we started uh, this, this partnership. And so with that in mind, I wanted to start off with my first question, um, which will, I will go to Tanya for first, um, which is what does the phrase partnering with patient groups mean to you? I'm very big on shared definitions and I think it's a slogan we all use, but I wanna know a little bit more about exactly what does that look like um, to you? Um, so I think when I think about partnership, um, the first thing I think about is that it has to be bi-directional. Um, so, and what I mean is there has to be an agreed set of like values and goals that are co-developed, co-designed, ideally, um, between patient communities and researchers. Um, so, you know, what partnership is not, like I think unfortunately we hear about patient engagement and it gets sort of thrown around a lot and people toss it around. I think patient engagement is, I engaged a patient community to donate samples. Donation is not partnership. It's important and it's, there's, a, there's a space for that and it's fine, but that's not patient partnered research. Um, so when we designed our, um, the RFA that I mentioned at the very end of my talk, that is, um, that RFA, the, the requirements were that researchers apply with a patient community and that the patient um, leader or designee is a co-PI on the project. And when we reviewed the applications that came in, I will be very honest and say that some of them, you could tell they weren't really, these projects weren't designed um, together. This was like a researcher who sort of added a, a group that they knew on at the end, right? Like that is not patient partnership. So it's about, um, it's about true bi-directional engagement um, and it's about projects that are co-developed, co-designed um, between uh, researchers and, and, um, and patient communities. At least that, that's what I'd like to see. That's a great answer and not to then <laughs> send it over to uh, other people to keep up to it, but I think um, both uh, Eric and Bomsey have really um, made a career out of partnering with patients and um, really listening to uh, the people that they work with. So um, I'll start with Bomsey since he's closer to me. Uh, how have you worked with patient organizations in the past and either a success story or something that you've learned from working with them? Yeah, we've, we've, because there's so many different rare mitochondrial diseases. We, we've had the real privilege of being able to work with a number of different groups, whether it's a larger group or a, a smaller group. And um, what I would say is, um, you know, from a science perspective, I, I think what we're fundamentally trying to do in, in the world of genetics, and to some extent in the life sciences, is, is we're always trying to connect genotype to phenotype. That's like the core of what we're trying to do. and. Uh, just from a purely scientific perspective, I mean, what I would say, one of the real benefits of being close to patients and their families is we sometimes get really, really deep insights that you simply are not gonna get them by looking at a mouse model. And uh, there's countless examples of this, but I think some of you are probably familiar with things like NGLI-1 deficiency. It's an ultra rare disease. And one of the really interesting initial observations was that these kids weren't producing tears, right? And it's a lot of the other features of that disease were kind of not that different than other neurodevelopmental disorders, but that was a very specific one. And suddenly, there's one case, you know, sort of in the Midwest someplace, another case in the East Coast. And uh, those two uh, individuals connected, I think, largely because of the high information content associated with that one very specific symptom. And so this is an example of wearing be or where being close or the scientists being close to the parents and the kids really provided a scientific insight that I think uh, was incredibly uh, empowering. And there's countless more examples like that where uh, we have learned so much about some of these diseases by literally just having conversations with our, our patients. The same theme? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. so. The inherited retinal disease space might be a little unique in this regard in that there's one very large patient organization in our field, the Foundation Fighting Blindness, which was founded actually about 50 years ago. And even though there are 280 different genetic forms of inherited retinal disease, pretty much most of the patient advocacy, advocacy in this area 
it goes through the Foundation Finding Blindness. I got involved with the Foundation Finding Blindness about 20 years ago when I was asked to be on their scientific advisory board. And that was really a, an amazing experience in my career. I eventually was chair of their scientific advisory board for 10 years, which meant a lot of time traveling and visiting and spending time with patients. And that really helped shape my career because, and, and I think it was bi-directional, which is an important point in that there's a large scientific advisory board of about 50 investigators who advise the foundation. So they're getting a lot of information about disease and how to direct their scarce resources to support research. But we were also getting a lot back in terms of patient engagement and understanding, and that really shaped my clinical practice. It led to the clinical trials that we're participating in and really enriched my whole career. So I, you know, it's been a critical part of my career all along to be engaged with these patients. And I think a large number of patients come to see us in our clinical practice and we're able to enroll subjects in our trials because of our longstanding relationship with them through this FFB. Thank you. All right, and I did uh, forget to mention that we are gonna have a Q&A at the end of this, so if anybody has questions online, I believe it's in the YouTube uh, stream that you can ask your questions. I am gonna try to get two more questions in before we open it up. Uh, so my next question, um, I'm gonna go to Charlene first so I can give her a heads up so she can start thinking about her answer. Um, how do we set a model of rare disease research and drug development that there's so that there's always a space held at the table for patient advocacy groups, even when that group is not formed yet? I think this is really important because as you know we, we think about next generation advocacy and how quickly you know research progress and therapeutic development is happening today um, you know a lot of groups have not formed um, 501c3s and so um, you know at, at rarex we've actually built that into our model we work um, directly with patient advocacy groups and patient advocates to help them to launch data collection and we have it's a different model, obviously, if you're working with individuals than working with a, um, a legally registered organization. And so we've had to make a lot of adjustments in terms of the way that we do legal agreements, um, you know, how our privacy programs are set up, how our patient engagement programs are set up so that we can work effectively with both, you know, kind of types of scenarios. And, you know, some of those organ some of those uh, informal groups will grow into a 501c3. Like, you know, I say that some people are, you know, flying the plane while they're doing their legal registration and others won't. And so I think that this is going to be a longstanding model that we need to support. Thank you. And to Yael, um, I did want to ask about, I think your triangle was great. And um, I was noticing a lot of the tools that are in the middle, you were saying, is a place that uh, patient advocacy groups can really um, fill in. But again, thinking about the fact that hopefully we'll be making advances where we may perhaps understand that something could be a, a target or a treatment without yet having the organization formalized in that way. Um, how do you think about this, this paradox of, of holding the space for the patient organization, um, even if they're not there, or how to make sure that they understand the importance of, of this um, sort of uh, their organization being developed so that they can really be um, a, a part of the conversation? So I think Global Genes has a great role, as Charlene said. The group of parents or patients that actually start these organizations are a very unique community. People that probably never, ever thought that they'd be doing what they're doing now, and here they are found in this situation where they need to create a community, create resources, hopefully develop therapies. So first of all, sharing success stories to motivate Parents that never thought they would do it, never thought they would start a Facebook page or a 501 3C. And by sharing these stories, we can actually motivate others to take that step and do it. And in parallel, increase the awareness of scientists that are working on these genes and these proteins to say, hey, there are patients out there that would benefit from your research. And if you get together with them, if you reach out to them, maybe your science would advance faster, better, not only publications, but some really gratifying experiences working with the patient groups that experience these mutations in these genes. And I did want to say about you know, the previous question, there are advocacy groups that are very well off financially, but many others are 
doing 5K runs. I'm looking at you, Terry, <laughs> over there. Golf tournaments, bake sales. We really have to be very appreciative and uh, respectful of that. And when a patient group comes to you and gives you a check, no, it's not an NIH grant, that's true, but it is money that was earned, a very hard work, so we need to make sure that our, the partnership is true because people worked very hard to create this partnership. I agree. Having Living in a town with a rare disease family, uh, that is Jocelyn Duff trying to cure her daughter's disease. Um, and it is, it's lemonade stand money. It's kids in our town who are going out, out of their way to raise money and make, or, uh, you know, whether it's signs or things like that. This really is the, the love and heart from towns coming in to help save these kids' lives. It's not, you know, giving it so your stock prices can go up. It's giving you the money that they raise to save their friends, so... I agree. All right, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> last but not least, I saved a, a good question, I hope, for you. Uh, so there are cautionary tales circulating amongst rare disease groups and in the media about how rare diseases are being dropped from pharma and research partners with no heads up, and uh, patient groups are having to fight to get access to any of their data that, again, they, they often pay to generate. Uh, how would you go about creating a biotech and research environment with more accountability, transparency, and trust with these patient organizations? Yeah, so I think if you look at history, there have been successful cases of collaboration. If you look at the CF Foundation with Vertex, was extremely successful. There are other stories as well. I know that recently there were a few cases, remember we're in a, a very tough uh, market environment and you have many companies had to call down their, their pipelines to, in order to survive. Eric, you mentioned one, one case which is unfortunate, unfortunate. It's even more unfortunate when that uh, company received patient funds or that therapy was uh, funded at an academic level by a patient foundation. So I think what's important, what you mentioned before, that there should be common objectives. First of all, a clear understanding from the patient foundation on how a for-profit industry works. Yeah. At the end, you need many resources, I'm talking a lot of money, to push a therapy, especially a gene therapy, to the clinic. And when the market's tough, uh, things have to uh, be paused or, or cut down. That's uh, that's uh, the real story. I think industry also needs to understand what's the goal of, uh, of the for-profit, what they're looking for. So at the end, I think there needs to be, one, a common understanding of what drives each structure, the for-profit, the non-for-profit. There have to be common goals. There has to be very clear guidelines and a cl clear contract. I think contracts are important when things don't go well. That's when you look, uh, a clear contract gives you a way out. So. I think having constant communication as well, if a company is not doing well financially and has to cut programs, I think communication with the not-for-profit in order to decide how to move forward instead of just taking a one-sided decision is critical as well. Many times you can find uh, a way out. Um, I think there should be clear guidelines and a way out also when the company does not want or cannot move a therapy forward for a not-for-profit to take over the IP, there should be some mechanism in which they can move the therapy forward if they can secure the, the funds and the expertise. But, uh, Thank you. Yeah. And I think if we have uh, about one more minute, um, I know that uh, Charlene and Yael, when we, we did talk about these questions a little beforehand, so they had a heads up. Um, you both had commented that you may want to chime in on this, so I just wanted to give you a space if there was anything else. I'll, I'll do it short. So I did mention the boot camp that we run for entrepreneurs patient entrepreneurs, new advocates. And one of the things that we teach, and we have a whole session on it, is how to negotiate a license or a sponsored research agreement with the tech transfer office. And we, we want to make sure that they know what their rights are when they fund research. And if a company licenses the program and drops it, and the advocacy, advocacy group wants to take it and continue developing it, that they have the ability to do it. Not only the desire, but also the legal ability to do it. So that's something we spend a lot of time talking about. 
And I'll just make one short follow-up comment, which um, I'm in absolute agreement that this is about having a really clear understanding between parties about what expectations are and having it in writing. You know, the one of the things that I think happens with a number of uh, groups, especially um, early stage, is they give gifts. And they don't really understand initially that a gift doesn't have a contract with it. And so even thinking about this in terms of it's not just biopharma, but it's really all the way upstream because that's where you know the research can start. That you know those um, you know S, uh, those SRAs that all, all of those agreements need to be really clearly laid out. That's a great point. Do we have any questions online, or I want to take the opportunity okay. to invite everyone in the audience to make their way to the mic if they have a question for our panel. But while people are moseying down, um, I did want to bring our online community into the discussion. Uh, the first question is actually for Vamsi. Vamsi, would you mind giving us a brief primer on the importance of biomarkers in clinical trial development and also the status of blood-based biomarkers currently for mitochondrial diseases? and just your general impressions about the importance of biomarker development. Yeah, I, I think they're super, super important for mitochondrial diseases and for all genetic diseases. I mean, from a clinical perspective, I mean, once the genetic diagnosis has been established, the next time that the patient comes and sees you, they're not asking, what is my diagnosis? They're asking, am I getting better? Am I getting worse? You ask me to exercise, am I getting better or worse? And uh, having nice quantitative markers is super, super valuable from a clinical perspective, I think uh, given uh, that there can be so much allelic heterogeneity and genetic heterogeneity for mitochondrial disorders, and again, this extends to other diseases, having rich biomarkers with which you can organize these ultra-rare diseases into subsets that can then be targeted for a particular therapy, I think that's going to be very, very valuable for the future. And I think it's useful to actually distinguish between rare and ultra-rare diseases, because I think with rare diseases, you know, rare is actually not that rare. And uh, it's quite feasible, as, as Farah has, has done an amazing job of organizing the Friedrichs ataxia community. There's you know, thousands of those patients uh, in the United States and worldwide. And so there's really nice natural history studies for those rare diseases, but for the ultra-rare diseases, where there may maybe ones or tens of, of, of patients, I think in those instances, having really high quality mechanistic biomarkers are going to be absolutely critical for uh, 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 monitoring therapeutic response in uh, a clinical trial setting. And so I think the genes have gotten pretty easy for mitochondrial diseases. There's more than 25 different clinical trials right now ongoing for mitochondrial diseases, but I think biomarkers is the great unmet need. And, and I'll just end by saying that I think in many instances, there's some great uh, drugs, uh, which make scientific sense, but they have failed whatever types of trials because they actually weren't given to the appropriate subset of patients or they couldn't quantitate the, the response either. So biomarkers. Hi, everybody. Um, so I have a question. It's just more of a statement. So as a parent of a rare disease uh, child, working on rare disease for the last four years. Dr. Weiss knows me really well. Um, I just want to thank everybody in the room for what you do every day and helping us um, work on therapies for our children and, and hopefully see an outcome that is better than what they have coming to them today. So I just want to thank everybody in the room for, for doing amazing things and, and, and thank you for helping us. For all of the panelists, how do we improve communication between researchers when breakthroughs happen um, and advertising that and sharing that with rare disease communities? Does anyone want to take that? So this is actually one of the values I found of working with the Foundation of Body and Blindness in that they sponsor meetings, not only of patients and scientists, but also scientific sessions regularly. It's kind of like a small Gordon conference in your field, and you get to hear about the latest and greatest in your field, often before publications. So that's one way that information can be shared between groups that might otherwise be considered competitors. 
Just to add, one of the reasons that we encouraged our groups in the network to host scientific, international scientific convenings was very much that idea. That, that um, well, there were two ideas. One was that they were hosting an international scientific convening, bringing their network together that they're forming and trying to grow and trying to reach um, other folks and other disciplines that might um, have some relevance to their disease area. But secondly, it's the patients hosting the convening. So you were talking earlier about bringing patients to the table. Patients are setting the table by um, actually organizing the convening. Obviously, they're doing it in conjunction with their scientific advisory boards and their um, advisors. But um, it's really the patient actually um, hosting the convening that we think also really helps further these patient-partnered efforts and aligning priorities. Um, as a uh, few of us have, have talked about, like this idea of really getting, really understanding the patient perspective with the disease um, and by ensuring that they're actually at these scientific convenings. And I'll just add that one great thing, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. Uh, one great thing about the way that we've set up our prevalence study is that we return the results directly to the patient organization. So other than maybe a lab meeting here or there where I'm working through a specific issue, the results go back to the patient organization first, and then we set up in that meeting discussions of you know, data sharing efforts and things that we need to move forward in order to uh, make sure this data makes it out into the larger community, but I really um, take the time and set the space that the patient organization gets to bring to the table, what do they wanna do with this data, and how do they wanna get it out, and I wanna make sure that they have the opportunity to really lead that conversation, and um, you know, our needs for what we need to do for our data sharing purposes are, are secondary to that, but we you know, this is their data. And so um, by giving it to them first, they are aware of it because we returned it directly to them. Sorry, I try that. Yeah, I just wanted to add pairing, um, you know, a scientific meeting and regular scientific meetings um, uh, where updates are given also with regular scientific updates to the community is very important. And so, you know, within SDXBP1, we typically will run our research roundtable um, like in conjunction with uh, a second day that is research updates for the, lay, you know, for the families and the lay people. And I think that's critically important for people to really be able to understand what um, this complex information is, um, you know, translated in a way that somebody who isn't, you know, in the lab every day um, can understand it. And then the other piece that's really important to that is it enables the community to get activated. So they, you know, like uh, the, the community has contributed and because they're starting to see that there's, you know, value from those contributions, they'll be more activated. And I think that's a really, really exciting virtuous circle. So among these ultra rare diseases with so few patients that we've all talked about and getting people together and educating them, uh, how do you think about manufacturing these drugs, right? There's a long road that goes with manufacturing these things. And a lot of these modalities are rather new too. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you want me to cry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's expensive, it's torturous, it's long and Hopefully, over time, it will become more efficient. Hopefully, the more disorders have therapeutic potential and approaches, there'll be more interest from bigger players, and that will help streamline manufacturing. But at the moment, it is very painful, I can tell you. And we raised $52 million, and I think more than half is going to, towards manufacturing at the moment. And it's, it hurts. Every day. <laughs> I, don't, I probably didn't answer your question, but I'm hoping for better days. <laughs> so I'm not sure it's a universal solution, but one of the things I've seen with the small patient-driven companies that have been set up is that they've been able to obtain kind of favored status with manufacturers because it's, and sometimes the manufacturers are willing to consider the service they provide as a donation. So it can reduce cost for manufacturing things like plasma and AAV if those smaller groups, smaller companies negotiate with manufacturers and providers. It also, by teaming up and bringing a bunch of potential therapies together, you can have a, a more attractive package for a manufacturer rather than just a single one-off rare disease production. You, you say your company's bringing them half a dozen, that might be more advantageous. So I, I think there's 
least might be naive, but it seems like from my point of view, there's an opportunity to get some attention from manufacturers in the rare disease space. Sorry, just to follow up on that. So are, are you suggesting that some of these patient advocacy, advocacy groups <laughs> for different disease areas, mitochondrial, ocular, others, team up on this? They certainly could. I guess I was thinking more within each individual disease space. If a group gets together, they might be able to, as a foundation, might be able to negotiate it with a manufacturer for a reduced rate. Or if there's a company founded in that field, that's trying to aggregate a number of therapies for ultra rare disorders that they might be able to negotiate with manufacturers. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you guys for being here. I guess my question is more directed to Dr. Vamsey, if I'm pr pronouncing that correctly. Um, so I was really intrigued by the bacteria that was being used to mimic the hypoxic state in within patients. And my question was, I'm assuming it's based off of the principle that bacteria that are functionally aerobes are going to kind of, I guess, metabolize the excess oxygen in the blood. Um, and so my question is, do you know of any toxic metabolites that those bacteria could be introducing into the patient? And also my second one is, what is the chance of those bacteria kind of growing and kind of altering the microbiome within the body? Um, I thought that was really cool. So um, I may not have been clear uh, in fully describing those results, but the uh, what I showed over there was that using the hypoxia tri trick, we can now engineer worms that are lacking the frataxin gene because we couldn't make that worm model previously. And then what, what one of the FAA investigators, Gary Ruvkin, and the postdoc Josh Mizell did is they then placed those Friedrich's ataxia worm models on a few hundred different types of diet. So one of them was standard E. coli, but then they also gave them other types of bacteria. And those bacteria were actually collected from rotting apples from throughout the world. And then they actually identified three different bacteria from three different rotting apples. If you feed those bacteria to the worms, it's now rescuing those worms, even though they lack the frataxin gene. And so initially, we actually thought that maybe the bacteria were sucking the oxygen out. We, th that's exactly what we thought initially. But now, we can actually grind up the bacteria. We can take the extract. So, the bacteria are actually producing something. We don't know what that something is yet, but, it, but that is rescuing the worm model of disease. And so the vision there is if we can figure out what that something is, maybe we can give that as a drug, or maybe we can actually give a probiotic where the bacteria is the medicine. So we'll have to stay tuned, uh, but hopefully over the course of the next uh, you know, one to two years or so, we'll know what that magic bacteria is and what it's producing as well. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much all of you for being here and, and doing what you do. Um, so I'm wondering, really the problem with rare diseases compared to other diseases is the small patient populations. But many of the things that we're targeting for you know, many of these diseases also have targets in other conditions. They're just not as severe. So when you think about that, very clear phenotype, very small population, less severe phenotype, much bigger population, might it be better to just start out with the second bigger population and try and get the therapy for that and say, if we get that approved, it's going to be easier for the severe patients, or is that just an extra waste of time with your life? So if I could respond quickly, but you know, I, I alluded to the fact that there's 300 monogenic mitochondrial diseases, so we're beginning with the initiative over here focused on Friedrich's ataxia for that exact reason. Thanks to the FARA uh, the, the Research Alliance group, there's actually a natural history study. They have a rating scale that's been used by the FDA. And exactly as you said, that, that's not an ultra rare, that's a rare disease. But our hope is that if we get something approved over there, then we may be able to extend it to some of the other more ultra rare diseases. And I think through biomarkers, even if you don't have a big one, if you have a lot of smaller ones, I think with judicious use of biomarkers, there may be a way of lumping them together with a scientific thesis uh, that then motivates uh, uh, you know, being treated with the same agent. I just want to add that actually working in small communities, the trials can theoretically be smaller, the cost lower, and if you prove a concept in a smaller population, then it makes more sense financially at least to go into larger populations, and it might be 
depending on the disorder and the clinical presentation, obviously, it might be easier to show that a drug is working in a smaller, more severe population and then expand to a larger population. But it depends if the disease is degenerative or not degenerative and what the natural history of it is. So it's a good point, but it might not apply for every disorder. So we are going to take two more questions, but I will point out that afterwards, uh, after Anna gives her, her close up, that we will all still be around. And so you are welcome to come down and, and talk to all the panelists. So uh, Tim. Uh, thank you all for a fantastic afternoon. Um, I just can't help but take the opportunity to ask a bit of a blue sky question. Uh, we've heard from many of you up on, on this panel today about how you've taken the skills within your own domains within this ecosystem in the nonprofit world, in the biotech world, uh, in the traditional company world, and uh, brought them to bear to reach patients where they are in really innovative and creative ways. So let me take the opportunity to ask our guests the same question about what you would do in our community here at the Broad. In addition to housing and feeding and clothing, wonderful scientists like Eric and Vamsi and Anna and others, what else could we be doing to apply some of the engagement principles that you've discussed today and that have uh, kind of pushed you in the last few years? I, I would start and say that start early in medical school or during grad school, introduce this concept of patient-driven drug development to students so that's in the top of their mind when they're starting their career. Uh, and, and that will create the next generation. Beyond that, I, I think that I just gave a talk at the Weizmann Institute a few months ago on what we consider as a proof of concept package versus what they think is a proof of concept package. And it's different, right? Because with science, you can wander in so many directions and write so many great papers but these may not be the experiments that are needed in order to take the drug to the next step. So education as well. Um, I would say a sort of straightforward thing to do. So as Anna mentioned, I was actually here at the Broad and my very first day on the job, I sat, I won't say who it was, but I sat down with someone and they said, I'm glad you're here because I think if you walked up and down the hallways, you will find out that there are most of the people working here are working in disease areas and have never met a patient with the disease. And it, no matter how basic your research is, I, I hope that like what a lot of us have said today is that even in really basic research, this is actually where we need to be engaging patients from the start. We all have an aligned goal, which is to get as fast as we can from where we are now and the understanding we have of each and every one of these diseases to some better future and a treatment. I won't even use the cure word, a treatments. And so if we can just align on that, the very first thing, like if everybody at the Broad community just said, every, every lab at the Broad, they said like everyone who, who comes into my lab, they're working on something that relates in some way to some disease, even if it's like somewhat tangential, we're all gonna meet patients with these diseases. That's gonna be a requirement. I actually think it might change the nature of some of the research that happens, and it might actually make research, or make research go faster, and it seems like it might be worth the experiment. Um, and if nothing else, um, everyone will be working within a different type of a context, and I think that's important no matter what. Um, so that's what I would say um, as a, almost a simple thing, but a very real um, thing that could be done at every research institution, not just the road. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, what one, one avenue is meeting patients, but I would go further than that. I think it's aligning incentives. Um, I think in academia, uh, the incentive is to publish learn and publish and do basic research, not curing patients. I think what one of the, the, the key roles that I, I play in my company as CEO, uh, in addition to many others, is remind our scientists that uh, we're curing patients, not mice or cell lines. And by the way, I have one of my uh, patients at home. So 
I think it's uh, providing that avenue to um, change our mentality. What do you want to do is cure patients, potentially get a treatment to the clinic. What I found out when I, I spoke about how many people have been supporting me from academia, very well-known researchers, all it took from me was I reached out, I asked for help, I told them why I'm doing it, it's for the kids, everybody was open. Everybody said, if it's secure the kids, I'll help you. So at the end, actually, everybody was looking for that avenue, that mechanism to help patients. So I think it's providing that avenue, that incentive, that patient in mind, that incentive and that avenue that you don't have to start a company to, to cure patients. There are many other ways of doing it. But um, I think that, that needs to come. Uh, it's a systemic change that needs to happen. Um, and, and it has to do with incentives, alignment of uh, incentives. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. And this last one. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the docs um, and really appreciate everything you all do. Uh, I had a specific question about uh, ultra-rare diseases that perhaps uh, affect neonatal populations with a very short inter like, window of intervention. How do you, like, I'm sure there are large numbers of, numbers of patient populations that would benefit from drugs treating these ultra-rare diseases, but how do you go about even determining the prevalence? And once you do, going about clinical trials with such a short window of intervention, uh, because it seems like a lot of companies would rather uh, mitigate the risk and look at something that has a longer intervention window. I can speak to the prevalence uh, question. So it's something that we are currently looking at from the angle, and I mean we, not just us, but a lot of, um, if you look in the literature, um, a lot of researchers where we're at, you know, we know the disease that we're looking for, and we're asking how prevalent it is. Um, and there is information to be gained there because we can look at the genetic prevalence using NOMAD and other uh, population databases to say, you know, is this far more prevalent according to the genetic information than we're seeing in our traditional public health kind of ways of, of uh, collecting prevalence and incidence. And then talking to the patient organizations and saying, you know, we'll have to do some checks on the math that we did and what variants we included, but it's also possible that recurrent miscarriage or early neonatal death is part of your phenotype spectrum. And to go back to your um, natural history studies that often they are collecting and say, you know, ask these questions and start asking in the family history, is there recurrent miscarriage in your family? So you can start thinking about, are these diseases presenting much earlier and having even more severe phenotypes, which can be hard to talk to families about because often if they're here, they already have a pretty severe phenotype. And to hear, you might be on the luckier end of the spectrum, um, can be a bit hard, but I think it opens it up. The other thing that we'd like to do is kind of flip the question on its head and say, okay, well, you know, if we're looking at a gene and saying how prevalent is it, can we start kind of going the other way and saying what are the, if we're looking at genetic prevalence, how prevalent are some of these diseases not having the disease first and start to take, okay, this, you know, according to just the prevalence of pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants listed in ClinVar, are some diseases more prevalent than we would expect? And perhaps those ones, again, could be part of this neonatal spectrum. So we are starting to look at how we can use genetic information to try to um, kind of answer this question about um, either, you know, neonatal death or, again, recurrent miscarriage. Um, the second part of your question I cannot answer, so I don't know if other people have answers to that. <laughs> diagnosis, early diagnosis is important, and sometimes you don't get the diagnosis early enough to act on it. And make sure that you have clinical sites up and running for these neonates as well, right? Because you don't always, you're not always in the right place at the right time. Uh, but I think that if we do have a chance to intervene early and we do have a chance to be there at the right time, this is actually the most rewarding opportunity for us and we should be doing it. Yeah. With that, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, and for um, Anna, and she'll come up and give the final remarks.
Okay, I know we're running a little late, so I'm going to be brief. Uh, this has been an incredible afternoon of learning. Um, I'm uh, grateful to each and every one of the participants and to actually each and every one of you and also the people who are online. Uh, this is a remarkable community and um, it actually doesn't end here. This is sort of the beginning in some ways. Um, and this is because uh, while it's wonderful to mark Rare Disease Day and come together and, and think about all these important things that we discussed and wrestled with today, many of the unanswered questions, um, I think as scientists, as physicians, as advocates, as patients, um, as biotech leaders, uh, we have an obligation to continue to push forward and do more. Uh, I think that we are in an uh, amazing moment in biomedicine where we have more capabilities than we've ever had. Uh, we've heard about many of them today. And sitting here at the Broad Institute, uh, where many of the innovations are happening within the building or within the broader ecosystem that surrounds us, uh, it got me thinking that you know, perhaps we have to actually do more. And, and how can we imagine doing more? Uh, this is, this is the, uh, the question. Uh, can we scale our efforts so that we're not working on one disease at a time? Can we use scalable technologies and our scientific skills to bring more benefits to patients? Um, can we accelerate the partnerships with patients in ways that um, are not a one-off, but actually are systematic, uh, platformized, if you will, in a way that uh, allows us to, uh, to do more and to do it faster? And so this was the idea about an accelerator. Can we, can we imagine a way that we could do this uh, differently from what we have done before? So last summer, um, I put a call out to colleagues you know, throughout our ecosystem. Hundreds of people showed up, and there was clearly a lot of interest in thinking about ways in which we can accelerate our efforts. Uh, many of the themes that we discussed today uh, came up, and of course, we don't have the answers for everything. But what is clear is that we are in this unique moment in biomedicine. We have tools available to us, and there's a sense of urgency that we can use them to try to uh, make progress. And so with that, um, I want to introduce Ladders to Cures. Um, this is a new initiative that we're hoping to build, and it will require all of you uh, and your help to participate and grow it. Um, the idea, of course, begins, as always, with patients. That's the inspiration um, for everything that we do. I think this was clear from all of the discussions today. Patients and advocates are helping us uh, come on this ladder, you know, this idea of scaling up uh, through uh, multiple phases of innovation uh, so that we can ultimately get to treatments. That's the definition of success, right? More treatments for patients. So imagining four stages, essentially, Genes of interest, you know, the Rare Genomes Project you heard about, you know, many other um, um, organizations that are doing sequencing. This is uh, commoditized more and more. This is something we can do more and more. Um, and so that's the first step. But then beyond that step, beyond the diagnosis, another theme from today, we need to understand mechanisms of disease and develop therapeutic hypotheses and not do this one by one, but to do it in groups of genes, groups of diseases, groups of mechanisms, whatever makes scientific sense in order to make progress toward a path to the clinic. With patients always with us, all the way up this ladder um, toward cures. So what else can we do? Well, you know, we are a community that builds a lot of um, tools and has incredible capabilities. So I'm thinking of cell imaging as one of those approaches. Uh, we have here uh, several technologies, including, for example, cell painting and other imaging tools uh, that we can uh, use. Um, this is one way to accelerate progress, so enabling technologies in cell imaging. Large-scale perturbation screens, you know, CRISPR screens. A lot of that technology was developed in this building and now is used the world over. We can use it as an accelerator for rare diseases, and I think this is also a theme that we heard about today. Uh, genomics to proteins, discovery portal. This is uh, something that has been spearheaded by investigators at the Broad. I think a lot of people are thinking about, wait a minute, we have the ability to look at the structures of proteins. We know where the mutations are located. Can we find a way to computationally identify those places where those mutations are going to do the most harm or places where those um, you know, mutations are uh, developing opportunities that are druggable. You know, we can, we can do more with that. We can accelerate our progress if we can use our tools uh, to the benefit of rare diseases. Of course, nucleic acid uh, delivery and gene editing, this is an aspirational goal, but what if one day we had a zip code for every cell in the human body so that you can deliver any nucleic acid uh, uh, modality you needed? We heard some of them today. 
These are goals that are not going to be answered in a year or two, but in the next 10, 20 years. And we here, we are the community of people who have to do this. Um, and of course, drug screening and repurposing, we heard some of that today. I think that there are amazing opportunities to do this in pooled ways that allow us to use economies of scale so that we can do better and faster. Um, of course, these are all enabling technologies, but they're no good unless we can actually deploy them in the way that they can bring benefit for patients and for groups of patients and groups of diseases. Again, we're always, patients are always with us along this journey as our scientists, physicians, our advisors, um, but uh, we need some leading edge projects. These are our demonstration projects, places in which we're actually going to deploy some of these technologies and begin to make progress toward the clinic. And I'm very pleased that we have already identified some leading edge projects for this initiative, but of course we will be uh, having an open call to the community to get more, more ideas that we can seed so that we can bring more projects forward. And, each and one of these leading edge projects, which I will not get into detail now, are going to be not just one gene or one disease, but actually multiple genes or groups of genes that are uh, nominated because they target a, a, a pathway, a nodal pathway. And it could be that they uh, affect different tissues. They cause different phenotypes. But the idea would be that they have something in common, like channelopathies, for example, could affect the brain, the heart. Um, the kidney, many different tissues. But there might be tools that can be used so that we can study multiple uh, mutations at the same time and we can make more uh, progress uh, faster. So this is just uh, one of the uh, uh, examples uh, to, to, to illustrate what this uh, initiative is hoping to accomplish. So ladder secures is something that I hope will catch on uh, around the road and around partnerships with many others um, in the entire community with the success ultimately being getting to that stage three as many times as we possibly can to bring as many treatments and cures to patients um, as we can. And it will take a village. It will take this village and many other villages, uh, communities of scientists, physicians, patients, and um, senior advisors. Uh, many of them are well-known uh, personalities in the biotech space who will help us uh, to try to advance uh, this initiative forward. So I'm closing our uh, day today with a call to action. I'm hoping that you will all be our partners as we hope to launch this initiative and really make progress over the next uh, several years here at the Broad, in the whole Boston ecosystem, and hopefully beyond. So thank you all for your attention, your participation, your enthusiasm. And uh, again, um, thank you for um, everything today to all of our speakers. Uh, a great thanks as well. Thank you.